following the path of all of the evidence. Wherever it leads, we are investigating as quickly as we can because speed is important. We're also investigating as thoroughly as we can because being complete and thorough is critically important, but it takes time. And thorough is critically important, but it takes time. The reason thoroughness is important is because every single link in the prosecutorial chain must be strong. It needs to be strong because trying this case will not be an easy thing. Winning a conviction will be hard. In fact, County Attorney Freeman is the only prosecutor in the state of Minnesota who has successfully convicted a police officer for murder. And he can tell you that it's hard. I say that uh, I say this not because we doubt our resources or our ability. In fact, we're confident in what we're doing. But history does show that there are clear challenges here and we are going to be working very hard and relying on each other and our investigative uh, partners and the community to support that endeavor. His family was important, his life had value, and we will seek justice for him and for you, and we will find it. The very fact that we have filed these charges means that we believe in them. But what I do not believe is that one successful prosecution can rectify the hurt and loss that so many people feel. The solution to that pain will be slow and difficult work of constructing justice and fairness in our society. That work is the work of all of us. We don't need to wait for the resolution and investigation of this case to start that work. We need citizens, neighbors, leaders in government and in faith communities, civil and human rights activists to begin rewriting the rules for a just society now. We need new policy and legislation and ways of thinking at the municipal, state, and federal levels. The world of arts and entertainment can use their cultural influence to inspire change that we need. There is a role for all who dream of a justice that we haven't yet experienced. In the final analysis, a protest can shake a tree and can make the fruit ball that fall down. But after that fruit is in reach, collecting it and making the jam must follow. The demonstrations and the protests are dramatic and necessary, but building just institutions is more of a slow grind, but equally important. And we have to begin that work as well. We need your energy and we need everyone's help right now. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, we'll take a few questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. With the sixty percent, when we have done, we have done so, and so uh, our concern is to put the, all the energy we can into putting forth the strongest case that we can without fear or favor of anyone or anything. These, these charges are based on the facts that we have found and we're gonna pursue them. Uh, the uh, county attorney uh, got a case from him. Uh, was he going to... Uh... Uh, gathering facts and has worked cooperatively with us at every single step of the way. Uh, we uh, cons consulted with each other on these charges. We believe that these are the right charges. Mike Freeman and I will be, we've signed a complaint for these uh, additional charges. And so uh, that's, that's what we're doing. So. The whole nation and even the whole world has been waiting some type of announcement from your office. 
Can you describe the process involved in your deliberation and what impact do you think today's decision might have, not just in Minneapolis, but for those across the country watching you right now? Unfortunately, I can't delve into our deliberative process, but what I will tell you generally is we gathered all the facts that we could, we reviewed the criminal statutes, we looked at case law, we consulted with each other, and we arrived at these charges. We believe that they're justified by the facts and the law. What does this impact have on them, this decision? The pursuit of justice is always good and right. And uh, we, I want to signal to them that um, we hope that they continue to raise the cause of justice, but do it in a peaceful manner. Uh, it is their right to express themselves. Uh, and uh, with that, I will say that they should, they should continue in their own communities uh, to get together to build uh, just police community relationships. We need the faith community to be involved. We need arts and entertainment to help inspire us toward justice. We need everybody. There's a lot more to do than just this case. And we ask people to do that. I want to thank you for asking that question because part of my comments were to help um, set expectations in a realistic light. The, you know, in order to be thorough, this is going to take months. And I don't know how many, but it is better to make sure that we have a solid case, fully investigated, researched, before we uh, go to trial, uh, than to rush it. Uh, we don't, we're, and so it will take a while, and I, I can't set a deadline on that. Way in the back. Attorney General, Chris Raskin here. The, the, the Floyd family had asked for a first-degree murder charge as well as their attorney. You decided to charge second-degree unintentional murder uh, while committing a felony. Can you explain what that charge means, unintentional murder versus second-degree intentional murder, please? Well, according to Minnesota law, you have to have premeditation and deliberation uh, to charge first-degree murder. Uh, second-degree murder, you have to intend uh, for death to be the result. Uh, for second degree felony murder, you have to intend the felony uh, and then death be the result without necessarily having uh, it be the intent. So that is the, that's the state of the law. The felony would be the, well he was, we would contend that uh, George Floyd was assaulted uh, and that, um, and so that would be the underlying felony. They accept any plea deals in this, or do you expect all four to go to trial? And secondly, when will the body camera footage be released? You know, I really don't have any any idea of what um, plea negotiations or anything like that. That's simply way too early to begin that conversation. Uh, at this point, uh, we are preparing to try this case. If something else happens along the way, we'll see. Um, but at this point, we don't have any. We don't. We don't have any plans in that direction. Any camera footage. Um, you know, that is something that I will. Uh, I don't have anything to report right now. Uh, at this time, we're focused on investigating the case, uh, and so I think at this time I'll. I will consult with the BCA and uh, other uh, partners on the case, and we'll come to a conclusion about that. Again, we believe in transparency, but we also believe in a thorough investigation. Most importantly. General, have the three officers been taken into custody? Uh, I'll allow um, Mr. Drew Evans to address that issue. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent of the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. Uh, we are in the process of uh, taking the officers into custody. I can report that one is in custody now, and the other two we are in the process of uh, taking into custody and expect them to be this afternoon. Eric, have you officers provided any statements to your investigators? Uh, I will, uh, as the Attorney General said, we can't speak about all the details of the case other than what's really uh, in the complaint at this time. I will tell 
and trying to uh, obtain all information. In this case, I will tell you that is a regular course of all of our investigations to attempt interviews with all of the officers. We have in interviewed uh, numerous individuals uh, in this case, and uh, additional information will be provided as we move forward. Here's my I believe we have the team to complete this work. I would like to just introduce uh, David Voigt as well. He is a deputy at the Attorney General's office. He heads the criminal division and he, he has the lawyers to get this done. And also we have some experienced lawyers at the Hennepin County Attorney's office. We're working on this thing together. Could say that um, I did not allow uh, public pressure to impact our decision-making process. I was prepared to withstand whatever calls came. Uh, we made the chart. We made these decisions based on the facts that we have gathered uh, since this matter occurred, uh, and made the charges based on. Uh, the, the the law that we think is applies um so but that's 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 my answer yeah it's going fine it's going great i i spent a lot of time in hennepin county uh, when i was a trial lawyer myself and i know a lot of the i know all these i know all the lawyers there i respect them all admire them all and we're, we're going along fine can I introduce you? Okay. Andy Lefevre, he represents uh, Hennepin County Attorney's Office, his first deputy at the, uh, for Mike Freeman, right? Yeah. No, that, that I'm gonna let the people who prosecute cases every single day to prosecute this case. Now, it is true that uh, I've tried a lot of cases and I've tried homicide cases, but on the other side of the courtroom. Uh, the people who know how to prosecute, I'm gonna let them do that work. You know, I, I think it helps me anticipate what some of, the, uh, some of the attacks on our case might be. I see no reason why we can't get a fair trial here. With the charges that were just filed, my math is correct. Do the three officers now face the potential same maximum sentence as Officer Chauvin? Yes. Well, um, but, yes, sir. Yeah, I apologize if you've addressed this before, but does your involvement in this case now put you on the sidelines in terms of the legislative process and working for police reform uh, legislation? No. Um, I'll continue to do all the duties that I have, which involve legislative, which involve a lot. We've been very active in the civil space. Uh, we've been active in representing state uh, agencies and government. We'll be, I'll continue to supervise that as I always do, but I feel, I feel very confident in it because um, I have uh, excellent professionals who are going to be focused on this like a laser beam every single day. I feel a tremendous sense of uh, weight. Um, I feel that this. I feel this is a very serious moment. I can honestly tell you I take no joy in this, but I do feel a tremendous sense of duty and responsibility. Are they going to be our highest in act security for the I don't know the answer to that question, maybe. I, I would just uh, answer that in terms of that is left up to uh, the various uh, sheriffs that we work with on this. They make, uh, as Commissioner Schnell noted the other day, uh, security decisions in the best place for everybody in light of everything. But we've lost daylight. Right.
I'm not sure we'll make it to Juno tonight. But we... To make sure that they uh, have everybody in their custody uh, where they uh, should be based on safety assessments. Everybody, you'll have a little later. Thank you all very much. <laughs> I will say to them that I pledge and I promise to hold uh, all to everyone accountable for the behavior that we can prove in a court uh, and that if I don't charge it, it means that we did not have the facts to do that. So um, I'll, I'll simply say that um, as the people who are legal professionals, professional prosecutors, uh, we are taking our duty seriously. And we are uh, working with the people who uh, uh, gather the facts, and this is, and we are, and we have done the, we have done the work that we we believe is is possible, ethical, and right. Yeah, well, I mean, look, um, let me be honest here. I mean, our country has had has under prosecuted these matters uh, in Minnesota and throughout the country. And so I think the trust is a result of historically not holding uh, people who are public guardians uh, accountable uh, for their behavior in situations where we should have. Uh, so that I think is the origin of the trust problem. But we can't, we can't control the past. All we can do is take the case that we have in front of us right now and do our good faith best to bring justice to the situation. We will. We have been listening to Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison, who announced an upgraded murder charge against Officer Derek Chauvin from third degree murder to second degree murder. Also announcing uh, that the state has brought felony charges against the three police officers. One of them is already in custody. Attorney uh, on a number of counts, two additional counts of aiding and abetting second degree murder. Uh, it found guilty on both those counts. Those officers could be in prison for 50 years. Let's get Judge Edward Napolitano and his read on all of them. For a number of reasons. Let's start here. The first significance I think of this whole press conference is the significance of accountability. People talk about legislation in federal, you know, in Congress legislation and state legislatures. The best thing you can do in order to resolve and help move this problem forward is to prosecute cases when you have evidence to do so, to your question. Here they believe they have that evidence. Now there's a distinction, people are wondering, wait, should it be first degree, should it be second, should it be third? Let's talk about what that means. If you're going to prosecute as a prosecutor first degree, you have to number one show that he intended, that is the officer intended to kill him. But not only intended to kill George Floyd, you have to show that it was planned, it was premeditated. That's punishable by life. That's a very hard push. The second issue now to what he did charge is the second degree, you simply have to demonstrate intent to kill, but you don't have to show a design or a plan or a premeditation to do so. That was upgraded, Jake, from third degree. What is that? It's when you're engaged in something that is, is very serious, right? You're engaged in serious conduct and you do it callously with a depraved heart. What conduct is that? Well, when you have your foot or excuse me, your knee on the neck of someone for that extended period of time, that seems pretty powerful. That seems pretty inhumane. It was the upgrading of the charges as it related to Officer Chauvin. Last point, Jake, and that's this. We also saw accountability as to the other officers who people might suggest were standing by. No, they weren't just standing by. They were doing something a lot more. And here's why it's relevant. If a person is merely present, they have no legal liability or culpability at all if you're merely present. But they were not merely present. The prosecutor's argument is that they participated, they aided, they abetted, they importuned. They allowed this to happen through their active conduct. And there's other, vi other video that would suggest that they were also kneeling on him, holding him down. And the final, final point is when they were doing so, he was saying things like what? Like I can't breathe, like I'm going to die. 
like calling for his mother. So this prosecutor is very motivated to find the truth that appears, and in finding that active investigating truth, he believes that he could sustain those charges, and that's where we are today. For a week ago, the world is watching. I mean, how do we know that the right charges are brought in a timely manner when no one's watching? Yeah, no, the charges, I think, are a good first step. But I thought what Attorney General Olson said at the end was really important. He said, look, charges are one thing. But we have to have the slow process of rebuilding our institutions and demonstrating trust and faith. And certainly, you know, this all didn't start with Donald Trump. You know, police brutality against African Americans goes back to the antebellum era, and today it's manifest in what counties do, what mayors do, what police departments do. So this president, of course, poured kerosene on it and aided by a bunch of local officials. And I think, to answer your question, Nicole, when we ask, what can we do? The most important thing we can do is vote and demand reform and accountability. There's a reason why last night Stephen King was crying in his white sheets, and it has to do with the fact that people voted. Mark Claxton, this is your work, this is your expertise, your thought. Thank you. It's actually on the high side, but of course that's just the government's request. The bail will be, picked, will be fixed uh, by a judge. I wouldn't be surprised if it's considerably lower than that. I also wouldn't be surprised uh, if they're put on some sort of a house confinement. But remember, these, these four people are pariahs in uh, Minnesota, and they're very familiar with the legal uh, justice system. They may be better off in, uh, confined during the time leading up to the trial than taking their chances and being out in public. Now, we know the officers had body cams. We don't know if they were functioning or working. We know they, they might have that footage available to them, that Ellison himself might have that available to him. Um, what do you think? Well, if they weren't functioning, then you have another infraction there about using a body cam that's not working or intentionally turning it off. But if they were functioning, Oh, good Lord, it's probably going to be a vision of this far more graphic and more horrific than the video that was taken by the bystander of the actual knee uh, on the neck. You're going to see four different views of this. You're going to hear every word uh, that was uh, articulated. It would be so graphic that, again, it would likely induce a guilty plea rather than confront the wrath of a jury after it, it uh, watched all those. And it's rather odd for, let's say, all four body cams to be out. Certainly one or, or more than one would have some sort of footage, you'd assume. Well, I would think so. I mean, stranger things uh, have happened. There is that so-called blue wall of silence. I don't want to prejudge these guys. But, Neil, if none of those body cameras uh, were working, at that point you have a conspiracy, which is another charge that can be filed against them, which would be a conspiracy to suppress evidence from their superiors and from a jury. Um, I, uh, Attorney General right. Ellison knows this. He may not know yet whether the body cams are working, but he knows the legal consequences of all four of them not working. All right. New charges uh, against the three officers uh, who were with him that day. All right, Sarah Seidner, thank you so much. Uh, I want to turn back to our legal analysts, Joey Jackson and Laura Coates. I also want to bring in uh, Cedric Alley. I think what's so important about Attorney General Ellison's announcement is, one, he made a very clear, concise attempt to say, on law enforcement, we all have to be on the same side. While he has essentially leveled a critique against the district attorneys of his own state by saying these are under prosecuted at the same time he's saying we're mm -hmm. working together and he called in his partnership with the federal government as well with the department of justice this was we were watching leadership that said we must work together in a fair neutral way but that carries the weight of justice with it and the thing we've heard from donald trump exactly the opposite. I mean, I would actually use stronger language and call him the tyrant-in-chief because his attempts mm -hmm. to actually draw 
a false equivalency and suggest that the problem we were facing in this country was that a quote-unquote far-left extremist were, were somehow, you know, kind of blowing up our democracy when the reality was, one, the FBI has not, has just said, we haven't found the evidence that, it, that there's some far less extre left extremist elements. What we have is angry citizens, and we certainly have some who go too far, but his suggestion that his need to be seen as strong and powerful is more important than the Constitution of the United States, is more important than allowing local law enforcement to be local law enforcement. What we were seeing in Keith Ellison is this is how it works at state and local level, and we will work in partnership with federal government when you allow it. But as a, as a country, as residents, it's our job to say, yeah, and you're not allowed to treat us the way we saw demonstrators being treated in Washington because he needed an, a press conference and, and some photo opportunity. Our democracy is not a photo opportunity, and Donald Trump must not be unchecked in his attempts to essentially break down, break down this critically important wall we have between uh, our military and domestic law enforcement, because that is tyrannical. Do you think these charges would have been brought today if that brave 17-year-old girl with her smartphone had not filmed the killing of Mr. Floyd? Would, would, would these charges have happened without that video evidence of it? Jake, I'm glad to answer the hypothetical, and I'm glad to give you an honest answer, and I believe no. I mean, let's just look and take a step back. You look at Ahmaud Aubrey, and you saw what happened in that instance where nothing occurred, right? It, nothing to see here a day after, of course, the killing of Ahmaud Aubrey, and the day after, prosecutor says nothing to see. A videotape surfaces demonstrating what occurred. It leads to outrage. It leads to people saying, I'm mad as heck. I'm not going to take it anymore. What is going on? And then we have an arrest and a prosecution. Forwarding to this case, fast forwarding, you have a tape where people saw the lack of humanity. They saw before their own eyes an officer committing a crime after they pleaded, that is the crowd, stop, you're hurting him, after he was himself, George Floyd, pleading, stop. And then it takes that long, Jake, to affect an arrest of him, and then today, nine days later, there's justice at least now for the rest of them, last point. And that is our colleague, Omar Jimenez, is out there in broad daylight doing his job so well, keeping the public informed as to what's happening, giving commentary as to what's occurring around him, and he in broad daylight is arrested for doing nothing. And so you look at the dichotomy, you look at the disproportionate treatment that's being offered here, and you get the outrage, and so something has to change. People, of course, need to be... Uh, you know, calm and they, you know, rioting, looting, it's not the answer, violence is not the answer, but we have to be vi vigilant and hold accountable, something has to change. And Laura, Minnesota Attorney General Ellison uh, said he expects these cases, these prosecutions to be a challenge. Take a listen. Because trying this case will not be an easy thing. Winning a conviction will be hard. But history does show that there are clear challenges here. Laura, what are those challenges? What are the biggest challenges in prosecuting uh, police officers, uh, for former police officers, uh, for crimes like these, second degree murder? Well, the concept of benefit of the doubt, you know, it works well when you're talking about presumption of innocence, it's heightened exponentially when you're talking about police officers, because overwhelmingly you have a jury pool who believes wholeheartedly in the bad apples theory not being true for this particular set of officers or anyone. They don't believe that any officer gets up in the morning with the intention to kill anyone or harm and only to do good. And you have to battle, frankly, as a prosecutor against that presumption and that benefit of the doubt that is given almost exclusively to police officers. In fact, when I prosecuted cases, one of the first things we have to ask members of the jury, even for cases not involving an officer as the defendant or an ex-officer as the defendant, is to ask the question, would you give more weight to the testimony of a police officer than you would to anyone else? And almost overwhelmingly, people will say, well, yes, actually, I will, because of the manner of the uniform and their public service. That's the first part. 
The second part in terms of the proving of the case is you got to have a jury pool that is going to be objective. Remember in the Rodney King case, it was very difficult to be able to find a jury who could honestly say, no, I've never heard of this case whatsoever. I have no preconceived notions going in and I'll be able to follow the instructions as given to me. That's difficult to grapple with. And finally, because you're talking about a, a group of human beings with divergent and often differing opinions, you have to have unanimity. You have to have everyone in agreement and oftentimes as you know with that benefit of the doubt with people's preconceived notions with people's just conflation of the rightful protesters seeking justice for george floyd and those who have hijacked it in the interest of looting it only takes one person to undermine this case all right thanks one and all for for your insights and your expertise appreciate it coming up said he couldn't break it was Reverend Al Sharpton of the National Action Network who made sure even when people attention left and went to Ferguson and went to Michael Brown, it was Reverend Al who was still with Eric Gardner's family because people forget they're killing black people so quick that you can't keep up. And so we are here proud that this family's call for justice was heard by so many, so many people. I mean, not just in Minnesota, but in New York, in Houston, Texas, in Europe, in Australia. I mean, everywhere. People have heard this call for justice for George Floyd. I do want to acknowledge the family's gratification to Attorney General Keith Ellison. We obviously were disappointed when the previous district attorney said things like there may not be evidence to support a crime. That was devastating to this family because we had all saw the video. And Reverend Al, we couldn't unsee the video. I, I mean, we saw it. You all saw it. One of the witnesses, Donald Williams, said that he watched firsthand George Floyd die. And he's the voice you hear on the tape saying, y'all are going to kill him. He literally said that it was like watching George suffocate compared to a fish out of water how it is fledgling and then the fish stiffens up and then the fish never moves again. He said he witnessed that. But we all witnessed it too. And because we witnessed it, we got emotional. And I pray that these emotions will have everybody act. So Attorney General Keith Ellison the family is grateful. He has a long track record, Reverend Al, as being a champion for civil rights. He said it best today. He swore oath to do justice. He didn't say just to do justice for black people. He didn't say just to do justice for white people. He didn't say just to do justice for brown people. Attorney General Keith Ellison said he swore oath to do justice and as Quincy said, that's all we want. Plain and simple. We just want justice. Nothing more, nothing less. So as his family prepares to memorialize George Floyd tomorrow at the North Central University where Reverend Al Sharpton would deliver the eulogy, and there'll be a lot of people really emotional. We don't want you to lose that emotion as the days and months go by. As Tesla Figaro just told me, we cannot celebrate because an arrest is not a conviction. And we want justice. You know, we don't want partial justice, we want whole justice. So I'm grateful with all the lawyers who are working with me on this matter, 
Attorney Tony Ramanucci, Attorney Chris Stewart, we're making a united front. This family is united in their quest for justice because we believe this is the tipping point in America where we finally address something they don't like to talk about, Reverend Al, the fact that there are two justice systems in America, one for black America and one for white America, when there should be equal justice for the United States of America. And so all these, all, I'll say a quick word about the autopsy before I turn it back over to Reverend Al, and we'll try to answer some of your questions. The autopsy conducted by the family by Dr. Michael Bowden from New York and Dr. Alethea Wilson, an uh, uh, impressive shop sister who is the director of pathology and forensic science at the University of Michigan. When they conducted their autopsy, they concluded the manner and cause of death medically was mechanical asphyxia because of the knee on his neck and the two knees on his back that were pressing down on his lungs, not allowing it to contract so air couldn't flow to and from and it cut off the blood to his brain. The legal cause of death based on the autopsy by the family was homicide, clear to the point. Reverend Al, they said that the EMT records show, and they found this based on the autopsy, that when they arrived, the male patient was unresponsive and pulseless. They put him in the ambulance, and they said they tried to use the Lucas devices to shock him. He still remained unchanged, his condition. When they delivered him to the emergency room at the hospital, he was still unresponsive and pulseless. Therefore, they have concluded that the ambulance was the hearse for George Floyd. And that's why we demand justice, because one of the officers said that I don't think he has a post. Maybe we should turn him on his side. And the uh, audio Reverend Al from the police body cam, Officer Derek Chauvin said, no, we'll keep him in this position. That is intent. He intended not to help a man who did not have a post, even though police officers by their very definition are first responders. He was handcuffed with his face down without a post and he kept them there for an additional three minutes. And I know this is very difficult, so I'm going to be quiet because this is Quincy's father. To many of you all, he's a hashtag for him. He's the person who gave him life. And so, Reverend Al. <clears throat> uh, well, I'll... Seem to really dial down the number of arrests. Um, the chokehold ever being used by the... I will be making specific announcements tomorrow during the eulogy about how we're going to mobilize. We must remember, in the last 30 days, we've seen Ahmed Aubrey killed in uh, Brunswick, Georgia. We have seen Breonna Taylor killed in Louisville, Kentucky. And then now we're here with, uh, with the case here with George. And clearly George Floyd is a spark that came, that people are coming out at the risk of their lives in a pandemic to rally and march. So the difference about this is that people have had enough. This combination of a trio of racism forced people out of their comfort zone. And I think that it's time for us to mobilize nationally and answer this, and we'll be laying that out tomorrow. Any questions? Boyd Hooper, I'm with the NBC affiliate here, Care TV. You talked about intent, Mr. Crump. Does that mean that you still think this should have been a first degree murder charge? Well, I will be clear. The family has always wanted first degree murder. They wanted him charged to the full extent of the law. Whatever 
George Floyd would have been charged with had the roles been reversed? That's what the families have asked for. Uh, Attorney General Keith Ellison informed this family that the investigation is ongoing. And if there's evidence that they discover that supports the conclusion of first degree murder, that they will charge it. And so the family has never wavered. They want these officers to be held to the full extent of the law. If only second degree is what Attorney General Ellison thinks he can prove, then the family is relieved of that. They want the most. You've heard Felonis on Reverend Al's show talk about his desire to make sure the man who killed his brother, the, the person who he grew up with, who he slept in the same bed with, you can imagine how they feel about losing their brother in this just unbelievable manner. So yeah, the family wants the max. And we have been listening to a press conference there with the family and attorney for George Floyd with the Rev. Al Sharpton, our colleague, but also uh, the founder of the National Action Network. We're going to go to NBC News reporter Shaq Brewster in Minneapolis. Shaq, how has the new immediately suspend New York's harmful bail reform? I mean, you heard Commissioner Shea talk about it, um, you know, just... the coronavirus pandemic, and it is day 10. Property management over the, the cost of demo. You think lawmakers need to move on? Oh my gosh, there's such a long list. Uh, the way that we police in this country is absurd. I mean, the fact that so many police departments, you know, they have internal investigations whenever a police officer kills someone. So I'm basically, I'm gonna put it in your hands to investigate yourself and tell me what, what, what you did wrong. I think that's absurd. I mean, anybody that has children, if you, if you told your children that, you know, you can, you can do whatever you want to and, and you can just tell me if, what your punishment should be. That's an absurd type of, type of situation. So what they should have an outside entity to investigate every police department as soon as there is a police killing. And then also what needs to happen is that police have to show a reason. They have to show cause. They can't just do what Betty Shelby did in Tulsa, Oklahoma, after she murdered Terrence Crusher and just say, I was in fear for my life. And that's it. They have to be able to actually show that there was a direct reason for them to, to brandish their weapon, for them to use lethal force. Right, right now, they just have a license to kill. And nobody can be above the law. You know, right now, Trump is, is worked out, you know, squashing the protesters. And he said he wants to bring force against the protesters. But he didn't say anything about overhauling the police department so they don't have a reason to protest. And that's where the focus needs to be. Whether it's changing the laws, changing the rules, so we have police accountability to where we, we if they do choose to kill another unarmed black man, a uh, black woman, the way they've been doing, that they are being um, put to jail, put, put in prison for it. And that will serve as a deterrent for the rest of them. But right now, they just have a license to kill. And it's not all police officers. I'm not saying that all police officers are bad. But, they, but there are too many police officers that have no accountability and they just have a license to kill. And that's not the way that we can run a system. Okay. Atan Thomas, Emerald Snipes, Garner, thank you both for your time. I appreciate it. To get something going on bail reform because a lot of these protesters who are arrested, they're right back out on the streets. We'll have more to this. national treasure to listen to her i always learn so much but i was thinking of the fact that both of us have worked for various attorneys general in our lifetimes attorneys general of the united states who go and prosecute these cases who use the civil rights division to enter consent decrees and who protect who generally try to protect the american public and then you have this attorney general who has not done any of that if anything he's fomented the militarization uh, and the reaction and has stood on the sidelines and you know attorney general ellison is the attorney general of a state minnesota but he's acting like the attorney general of the united states right now prosecuting and elevating the charges against that officer and the other three who I, I misspoke before and weren't just bystanders but people who actually actively aided and abetted this horrible murder that we saw all of us saw on video 
Maya, you've been uh, described as a national treasure. I'll second that. Your thoughts as these images fill our screen for a ninth day of Americans, old, young, of all races, all genders, taking to the streets in um, everything on our screen, peaceful protests from coast to coast. Well, I have nothing but love and respect for my friend Neil Katyal, uh, but and for you, Nicole, and Brian. I, I will say that the national treasures, in my view, are all those people you see in those images who are using the Constitution of the United States of America to defend the greatest aspirations of this country, which is for truth, for fairness, for justice and what we have always known and learn over and over again in this country is that those things must be protected while they are our expectation of our country they don't remain the reality of our country or don't become the reality of our country unless we fight for them and i don't think we've been at any more important moment than now because of the very things you've pointed out about Donald Trump because of what Neil has said about the Department of Justice. This is the time where we have to ask our institutions of government to govern fairly and appropriately. The administration has disputed that tear gas was used, though the CDC considers pepper spray to be in that category. The White House believes that moment mirrored Winston Churchill inspecting bombing damage during World War II. Churchill, we saw him inspecting the bombing damage. It sent a powerful message of leadership to the British people. Esper was already on shaky ground with the president, sources say. And today, the press secretary refused to say if Trump had confidence in him. As of right now, Secretary Esper is still Secretary Esper. And uh, should the president lose faith, um, we will all learn about that um, in the future. While Esper is distancing himself from that photo op, the president is defending it and dismissed the religious leaders who condemned it. I did hold up a Bible. I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. And many religious leaders loved it. In that interview with Fox News, Trump denied sheltering in an underground bunker as protest raged outside the White House. He says he did go to the bunker, but it was more for an inspection. I went down uh, during the day and I was there for a tiny little short period of time and it was much more for an inspection. There was no problem during the day. I've gone down uh, two or three times, all for inspection. Now, Jake, today the defense secretary also said he should have used different language when on that call with governors the other day talking about how to control protests and riots. He said that they needed to dominate the, quote, battle space. All right, Caitlin Collins at the White House for us. Thanks so much. A retired St. Louis police captain who was a father of five and a grandfather of ten was murdered. An unknown gunman shot and killed 77-year-old David Dorn early Tuesday. Well, they'll find a way to do that. Let me see if Kelly is good right now. Kelly, can you hear me now? Can I hear you slightly. All right. How are you holding up now? I'm doing well. How much did they destroy? Um, they pretty much destroyed the entire storefront of the bakery. So, so do you know whether police had tried to hold them back or what happened? Um, everything happened really fast. I know the, the rioting in itself and um, just from our call in to 911, it was a struggle, I know, for them to get to us. Um, it took some time. They had to, you know, fight through to even make it to our store. And, you know, as soon as they got there, they, they got us out and of the restroom that we were all hiding in. And they, they said, you have 30 seconds. Grab anything you want. We have to go. So they, they took everything or, or destroyed everything or both? What? Um, it was more of a destruction thing. They... You know, started with the windows. They there's a lot of glass in our store. We have a lot of you know furniture fixtures that are glass. So they broke glass for all windows. You know, they got every window, all the doors, and then our bakery case, which is sort of the focal point of our retail spot. They went to Tana. You're gonna rebuild. Of course, yes. It's 
it's very important to me that, you know, I don't let this bring me down. And, you know, not, not just me, all of my neighbors, small businesses, and Cleveland that were affected, this is a huge heartbreak for us. So, you know, as a team, we all just want to support each other and do what we need to do as long as it may take. I know for me, it's going to take some time to rebuild the store, um, but it'll be worth it. And, you know, I hope to come back better than before. I have no doubt you will, Kelly. I'm glad that you're safe, your workers are safe, but medical care, reaching out to people with this. We wish you well. Kelly Gandalf, uh, Colossal Cupcakes owner, now a colossal mess, but obviously um, she hopes to get it up and running and soon. It makes you think about the wisdom of protests that are meant to be a man who was wrongly murdered, and whether that has a... Yeah. Attorney General, thanks so much for joining us. I know you've had a crazy day today, a very, very busy day, a, a historic day indeed. You've now upgraded the charge against Derek Chauvin from third degree murder to second degree murder. Uh, what was the result of the new evidence that you got that, you, that uh, resulted in this dramatic and very important development? Well, we uh, could just continue to investigate and gather facts. We work with our team and we believe that the uh, factual basis was there for this charge. Uh, it is a, an ethical charge. It's a charge rooted in facts that we can prove. And so uh, that's what uh, brought us to this conclusion. As you know, um, it's, not, it's not allowable for me to comment on the evidence uh, and to talk about the investigation, but uh, as information rolled in, it, 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 made it, uh, it made it necessary for us to uh, adjust these charges. And can you share any of that? Alliance, an initiative that Obama launched as president, arguably to help address a crisis just like the one this country is facing right now. We expect President Obama's remarks to begin momentarily, and we will bring you his opening remarks live right here. When that happens, we will also bring you the discussion that will follow, not just those remarks, it's fascinating. We'll hear from folks, including former Attorney General Eric Holder. But as I mentioned, we are going to hear from the former president just moments after Minnesota's Attorney General Keith Ellison announced formally that charges against former information including video information uh, as well as other types uh, and so all of that factored into the mix. The, the other three police officers, I should say ex-police officers, are now facing charges of right. aiding and abetting second degree murder and aiding and abetting second degree manslaughter. Uh, tell us how you uh, landed on those charges. Well, um, if you uh, assist somebody in the commission uh, of a crime, uh, then you can be held liable for that same crime, even though the principal actor um, um, uh, is the one who uh, is driving the, the action for the crime. If you assisted a uh, police officer for murder, it prompt the lawyer for the family at a uh, press conference, I guess, or com commemoration at the, at, the, at the site of the murder, uh, said that in his opinion this was torture and that he sees it therefore as a necessity that you that you charge the other officers with standing by as they could see that torture was taking place and they could hear Mr. Floyd saying that he can't breathe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lawrence Jones, you've had a three hours now since we last saw you on the daily briefing to um, Think over this information and digest it and get your thoughts now. Yeah, um, I, I remember last Friday, Dana, I predicted this on the, fri on the five because it was just in the probable cause complaint when it said that an officer said that he was concerned, that was one strike. When he said he wanted to flip him over because he, you know, he's indicating that something is going on. Then you have the other officer that checks the pulse and says that he's not able to find the pulse. There was another strike. And then he stays on his neck for almost three minutes after. I think that's where you're gonna see the prosecutors make that case that there was intent in play. The problem with that is, uh, as they've charged the other officers, which I think they should, those officers, those two specifically, especially the one that checked the pulse, is gonna make the case that I tried to stop him by saying I could not find a pulse. Now, even though I didn't physically stop him, I at least alerted him that there was a problem there. Mm -hmm. All week, 
uh, in Minnesota. He did several times was a call for patience because he said that this process is going to take months and of course we've seen just within the last 10 days what can happen after a situation where you don't get the, the charge that you want immediately um, and now they could look at months before justice is uh, meted out. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I, it's kind of hard for me to be happy about this. I mean, if they had done this sooner, could we have prevented all the destruction mm -hmm. and mayhem? Mm -hmm. Or would it have mattered at all at this point? The people I saw lo looting and destroying my neighborhood, they weren't politically active. They were criminally active. They were having a blast destroying mm -hmm. people's livelihoods. So I don't think... There, people have been going in in the middle of that circle randomly, spontaneously going and speaking about what this means to them and what the death of George Floyd has meant to them. And you've been seeing this scene all day since the beginning of the day when you saw his son, Quincy Mason, come. He went over to the location, the exact spot where George Floyd was killed. He got on a knee. He took a prayer. You also saw the governor come and pay his respects. That's what this scene has become. It's been described by so many as a sacred ground where people can come, pay their respects, but also have this sense of community. If you saw the crowd earlier, you look at the crowd today, it's a diverse group of people. It's people from all walks of life, from all over the country, Chuck, that I've met and had interactions with. And that's what you're continuing to see. What they got today and the news they got today of not only Officer Chauvin, his charges being upgraded, but also the charges against the other three officers is exactly what they've been calling for. They say it's overdue, yeah. and they're saying now they want a conviction, that that was not enough, that was just the first step. Chuck? Hey, Shaq, I want to talk to you about uh, uh, some more things with the protest, but I want to play another bite from the Attorney General, Keith Ellison, on on how we're going to go. Like It looks like we've been uh, moving, at a, uh, uh, moving really quickly, but he's reminding people this is now going to take quite some time. Take a listen to his comments. In the final analysis, a protest can shake a tree and can make the fruit ball that fall down. But after that fruit is in, hard for me to go hooray. Yeah. We kicked um, the riots yeah, down the road. I don't think road. anyone is saying hooray. Jesse, one of the things that prosecutors keep stressing in addition to patience is that the burden of proof is to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. and. That was why I think it took some time for the prosecutors to figure out what the charge was going to be for the other three officers in addition because, as Greg said, like, if they go to trial and these, the jury doesn't convict, you know, then the prosecutors will be in a really bad way and so could all of us. Well, Keith Ellison knows a lot more than we do, Dana, and he's got investigators looking into the relationship between the officer and Floyd. Because if you think about it, and I'm only speculating, you don't just jam your knee under the neck of a guy that you don't know for no reason. Yes, maybe he's some insane racist that just wanted to kill an innocent black man. It's possible. It's just not likely, in my opinion. Um, from what we know, they worked at the same club together, a nightclub which had a lot of suspicious activity. People should be looking into the nightclub. Was it a front for something? Was there any sort of trafficking going on? Mm. They worked closely together on a regular mm. basis. Um, also, Floyd uh, rumored to have moonlit in another industry, which is kind of provocative. There could be a lot of reasons that their relationship became controversial. Let's just put it that way. And maybe Floyd knew something he wasn't supposed to know. Maybe there was an operation that we're not aware of that's soon going to be investigated. Because if you have a guy kneeing a guy in the neck like that over a counterfeit 20, and you have the rest of the crew standing around and watching, it looks like a premeditated hit. And then when you have the first report that come out to say, oh, you know, he didn't die that way. Yeah. He had a bad ticker. He was on methamphetamine, all sorts of narcotics mm -hmm. in the system. That's highly suspicious because then other reports came out directly afterwards contradicting that. So there's a lot of things at play. And you could find at the end of the day, this is not racially motivated at all. This was some sort of criminal thing that went haywire and this was a hit that was executed extremely poorly and they, did, they thought they were going to get away with it, while the rest of the country runs wild and tries to, you know, capitalize on the energy 
from coming out of a lockdown and knowing that Biden's not going to ramp up that kind of energy, they got to ride this energy out until November. Je yeah, Dana, Jesse makes, ahead, an interesting, yeah, Jesse makes an interesting point when it comes to the autopsy report. And as you know, that many audience may not know that the, the person that conducts the autopsy report is a member of the state. And so, you know, there is working relationships between the police departments because they depend on them to figure out uh, the cause of death and when they, uh, th these uh, victims die. And so, you know, they use them a lot during their investigation. So there's going to be back and forth on the conclusion that an independent autopsy and, and people that are around the world that are respected in the industry came up with um, versus what they did. Also, when it, as we're talking about the attorney general as he got these charges, it's something very critical here. Um, it takes eight to 12 months in Minnesota to come up with a case to just even charge, to get those, uh, those documents a probable cause. Not even get a conviction, but just charge uh, if it's a cop. That is not the same for a private citizen. And so as we're talking and having these conversations about different reforms, many Americans, especially people in the community, are going to be asking, why is there a different standard for a private citizen versus a law enforcement officer? And I think they deserve an answer. It's a great question. All right. Thanks, everyone. Coming up, former President Obama set to weigh in on the death of George Floyd. But up next, Greg's monologue. So, I don't know. Later this year, early next year, it's really hard to say. Be dramatic, and they might be um, really powerful, but the hard work of constructing a just society in which everybody can expect equal protection under the law is going to be done in church basements and meeting rooms and community meetings. And some of those meetings are going to go long and some of those ideas are going to, they're not going to be glamour. There, there won't be cameras there at these meetings, but they are absolutely essential for the real work to be done. We need to ask people in all communities all over this country, can we sit down with your local police department and talk about how we can have use of force reviews, how we can talk about um, how we can work together in a way that can restore trust. Those are the tough meetings, and they, they won't be fixed. Um, they, Washington will help, but they won't fix in Washington or in St. Paul. They will be at the municipal level, at the community level, community to community, and that is how that good work will be done. Uh, and Because that's the way things change in America. People sitting debt together, listening to each other, making commitments to have a better way forward. Very quickly, before I let you go, I know you got to run. It's been a very, very busy day for you, Attorney General. Uh, what do you want the federal government to do, the Justice Department? Because we know the FBI and others at the Justice Department have been looking potentially at civil rights violations involving these former police officers. What's your, what's your thought about what, if anything, you would like federal law enforcement authorities to be doing? Well, I can tell you that uh, our local U.S. Attorney in Minnesota, Eric McDonald, is uh, leading an investigation on what they call a color of law investigation, such as a civil rights investigation. Uh, I can also tell you that uh, even uh, Attorney General Barb made it clear uh, to me that he uh, is backing her 100%. I think that's a good thing. We want to be bipartisan on this stuff. We don't. We want to say justice is what we're pursuing without regard to political ideology. We want to make sure there's a just result for this family, this community. So we're working with our partners in the federal side. They uh, if Chauvin doesn't get convicted of second degree murder, what happens to those charges of aiding and abetting? They can still be convicted. Yeah. Is that, they, I, 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 Pete, they could, okay. Go, go, go ahead, sorry, Paul, Paul you go ahead. Paul knows the here better, yeah. but, but yes, they can, even if the principal, the person who did the thing that you're accused of, of aiding and abetting, is found not guilty. Gotcha. You can still be convicted. I think I'm right about that. Am I not, Paul? Yeah, yeah, Paul, that's go ahead. Right. It's what we call an inconsistent verdict. Even with felony murder. So felony murder is a murder that you don't intend to commit. So there's a little bit of a conceptual puzzle with how you can aid and abet someone to doing something that they don't even intend to do. But again, these are kind of legal right. fictions. There should be a lot of case law precedent in Minnesota on this. 
Uh, the bottom line is all four of these officers are looking at a lot of time. If this is what the if this is what the protesters wanted, they have won. They got what they wanted. The book is has been thrown at all four of these cops. Pete, uh, four trials, four separate trials. Uh, is there any sort of order they sh or end up going in? Any formal order? Does the Chauvin charge go first, or how does this work? You know, I'm not sure about that. In, in federal court, generally, they try to keep these things together. If, certainly, if one of them peels mm -hmm. off, then that would be a separate trial. Whether the other two would be tried, the, the two police officers who are with him, uh, King and Lane, whether they would be charged together or tried separately, tried together, and then Chauvin tried separately, I just don't know. Paul, what's your sense of what, what, what what's most likely here? Is, is it would the three officers be tried at the same time, or would those be separate trials, and then Chauvin separately? Chuck, this is going to be a pitch battle. This is going to be one of the most important aspects of the case. The prosecutor will seek to try all four together. Each defense attorney will say, no, I want my client tried by himself. In the Freddie Gray case in Baltimore, when numerous officers were implicated, everyone was charged at the same time, the judges ended up separating all of those into individual trials. Paul, what is the part of this prosecution, because not getting a conviction here would, 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 would be pretty upsetting to the community. What do you think the, tough, the, the toughest part of this prosecution is gonna, going to be? I think convicting them of the highest uh, degree that they're charged with murder too. And that's why the prosecutors left in the third degree murder charge and also the voluntary manslaughter charge. All right, There's Paul often Butler, I don't mean to cut you off. Don't mean to cut you off, but we're going to go. We're going to be hearing from former President Obama. He's about to speak about George Floyd's death and the unrest in America. So let's go to him now via their live stream. Here it is. United States of America, President Barack Obama. Man, thank you. Man, that was unbelievable. Uh, and, and we could not be prouder. Uh, and you are a hard act to follow. So... Uh, you know, I can't wait to see all the great things that you're going to be doing in the future. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, all the participants, all the panelists. Uh, you know, let me start by just acknowledging that uh, we have seen in the last several weeks, last few months, uh, the kinds of epic uh, changes and events in our country that uh, are as profound as anything that I've seen in my lifetime. And I'm now a lot older than player. I'm uh, going to be 59 soon. Uh, and, and let me begin by acknowledging that although all of us have been feeling pain, uncertainty, disruption, uh, some folks have been feeling it more than others. Uh, most of all, uh, the pain that's been experienced by the families of uh, George and Brianna and Ahmad and Tony and Sean and too many others uh, to mention, uh, those that we uh, thought about during that, that moment of silence. Uh, and to those families who've been directly affected by tragedy, uh, please know that Michelle and I and the nation grieve with you, hold you in our prayers. Uh, we're committed to the fight of creating a more just nation in, in memory of your sons and daughters. Uh, and we can't forget that even as we're confronting uh, the particular acts of violence that uh, led to those losses. Uh, and they filmed it. It wasn't, it, you didn't see anybody helping him. You just saw. That have led to a disproportionate number of infections and loss of life in uh, communities of color. So uh, in, in a lot of ways, what has happened over the last several weeks is uh, challenges and structural problems here in the United States uh, have been thrown into high relief. Uh, 
they're the outcomes not just of the immediate moments in time, but uh, they're the result of a long history of slavery and Jim Crow and redlining and institutionalized uh, racism that uh, too often have been uh, the plague, the original sin of our society. Um, and in some ways, as tragic as these past few weeks have been, as difficult and scary and uncertain as they've been, uh, they've also been an incredible opportunity for people to be uh, awakened to some of these underlying trends. And they offer an opportunity for us to all work together to tackle them, to take them on, to change uh, America and, and make it live up to its highest ideals. Uh, and part of what's made me so hopeful is the fact that so many young people have been galvanized and activated and motivated and mobilized. Um, because historically, so much of the progress that we've made in our society uh, has been because of young people. Dr. King was a young man when he got involved. Cesar Chavez was a young man. Malcolm X was a young man. The, the leaders of the feminist movement were, were young people. Leaders of union movements were, were young people. The leaders of the environmental movement in this country and the movement to make sure that uh, the LGBT community uh, finally had a voice and uh, was represented were young people. And so when I want, when, when sometimes I feel despair, I just see what's happening with young people all across the country and the talent and the voice and the sophistication that they're displaying. And it makes me feel optimistic. Uh, it makes me feel as if, you know, this country is going to get better. Um, now, I, I want to speak directly to the young men and women of color in this country, uh, who, as Plan just so eloquently described, have witnessed too much violence and too much. Good luck to you. Thank you. All set? Yes. Okay. I, I want to speak directly to the young men and women of color in this country, uh, who, as Plan just so eloquently described, have witnessed too much violence and too much death. And too often, some of that violence has come uh, from folks who were supposed to be serving and protecting you. Um, I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that your lives matter, that your dreams matter. And when I go home and I look at the faces of my daughters, Sasha and Malia, and I look at my nephews and nieces, I see limitless potential that deserves to flourish and thrive and you should be able to learn and make mistakes and live a life of joy without having to worry about what's gonna happen when you walk to the store or go for a jog or are driving down the street uh, or looking at some birds in a park. Uh, and, and, and so I hope that you also feel help, hopeful even as you may feel angry because you have the power to make things better and you have helped to make the entire country feel uh, as if this is something that's got to change. You, you've communicated a sense of urgency uh, that is as powerful and as transformative as anything that I've seen uh, in recent years. Um, I want to acknowledge the, the folks in law enforcement that share the goals of reimagining police because there are folks out there who took the oath to serve your communities and your countries, have a tough job, and I know you're just as outraged about the tragedies in recent weeks uh, as are many of the protesters. And so we're grateful for the vast majority of you who protect and serve. I've been heartened to see those in law enforcement who've recognized, let me march along with these protesters. Let, let, let me stand side by side and recognize that I want to be part of the solution uh, and who show restraint and volunteered and engaged and listened because you're a vital part of the conversation and, and change is going to require everybody's participation. 
Um, now, when I was in office, as was mentioned, uh, I created a task force on 21st century police uh, policing in the wake of uh, the tragic killing of Michael Brown. That task force, which included law enforcement and community leaders and activists, was charged to develop a very specific set of recommendations to strengthen public trust and foster better working relationships between law enforcement and communities that they're supposed to protect, even as they're continuing to promote effective crime reduction. And, and that report showcased a range of solutions and, and strategies that were proven and that were based on data and research to, to improve community policing and, and collect better data and reporting and, and identify and, and do something about implicit bias and how police were trained and, and reforms to use the, the force that police uh, deploy uh, in ways that uh, increase safety rather than precipitate tragedy. And that report demonstrated something that's critical for us today. Most of the reforms that are needed to prevent the type of violence and injustices that we've seen take place at the local level. The reform has to take place in more than 19,000 American municipalities, more than 18,000 local enforcement jurisdictions. And so as activists and everyday citizens raise their voices, we need to be clear about where change is gonna happen and how we can bring about that change. It is mayors and county executives that appoint most police chiefs and negotiate collective bargaining agreements with police unions. And that determines police practices in local communities. It's district attorneys and state's attorneys that decide typically whether or not to investigate and ultimately charge those involved in police misconduct. And those are all elected positions. And in some places, there are police uh, community review boards with the power to monitor police conduct. Those oftentimes may be elected as well. The, the bottom line is, I've been hearing a little bit of chatter in the internet about voting versus protest, politics and, and participation versus uh, civil disobedience and direct action. This is not a either or, this is a both and. To bring about real change, we both have to highlight a problem and make people in power uncomfortable, but we also have to translate that into practical solutions and laws that can be implemented and we can monitor and make sure uh, we're following up on. So, very quickly, uh, let me just close with a couple of specific things. What can we do? Number one, we know there are specific evidence-based reforms that if we put in place today, would build trust, save lives, would not show an increase in crime. Those are included in the 21st Century Policing Task Force report. You can find it on Obama.org. Number two, a lot of mayors and local elected officials read and supported the task force report, but then there wasn't enough followed. So today I am urging every mayor in this country to review your use of force policies with members of your community and commit to report on planned reforms. What are the specific steps you can take? And I should add, by the way, that the original task force report was done several years ago. Since that time, we've actually collected data in part because we implemented some of these uh, reform ideas. So we now have more information and more data as to what works. And there are organizations like Campaign Zero uh, and Color of Change and others that are out there highlighting the, uh, what the data shows, what works, what doesn't in terms of reducing uh, incidents of police misconduct and violence. Let's go ahead and start implementing those. So we need mayors, county executives, others who are in positions of power to say this is a priority. This is a specific response. Number three, every city in this country should be a My Brother's Keeper community because we have 250 cities, counties, tribal nations who are working to reduce the barriers and expand opportunity for boys and young men of color through programs and policy reforms and public-private partnerships. So go to our website, get working with that because it can make a difference. 
And, and, and let me just close by saying this. Um, I, I've heard some people say that um, you have a pandemic, then you have these protests. Uh, this reminds people of the 60s and the chaos and uh, the discord and distrust uh, throughout the country. I have to tell you, uh, although I was very young when you had riots and protests and, and assassinations and discord back in the 60s, um, I know enough about that history to say there is something different here. You look at those protests, and that was a far more representative cross-section of America out on the streets, peacefully protesting, and who felt moved to do something because of the injustices that they had seen. That didn't exist back in the 1960s, that kind of broad coalition. The fact that recent surveys have showed that despite uh, some protests having then been marred by the actions of some, a tiny minority that engaged in, in violence, that despite, you know, as usual, that got a lot of attention, a lot of focus, despite all that, a majority of Americans still think those protests were justified. That wouldn't have existed 30, 40, 50 years ago. There is a change in mindset that's taking place, a greater recognition that we can do better. Uh, and that uh, is not a, as a consequence of speeches by politicians. That's not the result of um, you know, spotlights in news articles. Uh, that's a direct result of the activities and organizing and mobilization and engagement uh, of so many uh, young people across the country uh, who put themselves out on the line uh, to make a difference. And, and so I just have to say thank you to them and, uh, for helping to bring about this moment and just make sure that we now follow through. Because at some point, you know, attention moves away. At some point, protests start to dwindle in size. And it's very important for us to take the momentum that has been created as a society, as a country, and say, let's use this uh, to finally have an impact. All right? Thank you, everybody. Proud of you guys. Uh, and uh, I know that uh, we're going to be hearing from a, a bunch of people who have been on the front lines on this and uh, know a lot more than I do about it. Proud of you. Thank you, Mr. President. You just heard there, you've just been hearing from President Obama. He's been addressing the My Brother's Keeper Alliance. Uh, it's a virtual town hall, and in just a moment, there's actually going to be a panel discussion that will include former President Obama, the former Attorney General Eric Holder, and we want to bring you that as well when that begins. In the meantime, joining me now are Miami News colleagues Kristen Walker and Joshua Johnson. Also with us is Cornell Beltre. He's a Democratic pollster, MSNBC political analyst. In fact, was a pollster for some guy named President Obama uh, back at... Back back when we all had a little less gray hair. Hello, Mr. Belcher. Nice to see you, sir. Uh, Joshua, uh, we, we want to remember that this foundation is about, this. he started it, this was about uh, bringing a focus on uplifting young men of color. Um, what did you make of the message he sent? Joshua, I think we have an audio issue. We may want to check. We Sorry, have, we can you hear me have audio from you. How about now? Okay, we've got you. How about that? We, yeah. we, we went to President years Obama's of live radio, stream, no problem. I left myself on mute. Yeah, it's uh, YouTube <laughs> exactly. that never worked All in radio. Right. Um, never. But anyway, ahead, as I was sir. trying to say before I really button. interrupted myself, President, I promise, President Obama made his presentation very much about young people. The young man who introduced him, I was watching a little bit of the stream before it started, he was doing this very powerful uh, spoken word piece about young people dealing with violence on their streets. Go to YouTube and wind it back when you get a second. It was very moving and it spoke to the very energy that President Obama praised in terms of how social movements happen. He was giving these young people some of the guidance that I think a lot of veterans of social movements have given in terms of the need to marry 
protest with policy, with precise policy. In the 21st Century Policing Task Force report, which has six specific pillars that it proposes, I don't think that's going to be as big of a challenge now as in the past. Because in the 60s, if you wanted to know, you know, what beyond a reasonable doubt meant or what the 21st Century Policing Task Force meant, you didn't have one of these magic know-it-alls that you could pull out of your pocket and use to not only find the information but send it to someone else who you thought needed to know it. I don't think this is going to go the way that previous movements have gone, especially because this is an election year. And there's a reason why President Obama said that every mayor needs to be on this, because there's all these down ballot ticket items that Democrats have not done nearly as good a job as Republicans of galvanizing voters around actively demanding precise policies on. So I think he was really trying to not only get people who share his view to be active, but also to activate young people who may feel disenfranchised, who may feel left out, or who may just think that their votes don't count. Kristen Walker, I thought it was interesting the point he made about saying, hey, this is not 1968. This is different. And, and um, I, I, I sort of, I, I take his point there, but I'm just curious what you made of that. I thought it was interesting he wanted to make that. He, he, he definitely didn't, he's trying to change that narrative, that's for sure. Absolutely, that line stood out to me as well, Chuck, and in some ways, the pres former president's remarks were signature Obama. Uh, we heard him make similar comments when he was in office that, look, things are difficult, but so much has improved since the 1960s. Um, and you heard him talk about the coalition, the fact that we see a diverse group of protesters out on the streets. This is not just an issue that's being fought by one group of people. And so, uh, President, former President Obama trying to find optimism in that and in those optics. You heard him thank the protesters, right. Chuck, at the end of his yeah. remarks. I thought it was also notable for the fact that, look, he drew a sharp distinction with the way in which President Trump is handling this crisis without ever mentioning President Trump by name. He was careful in his words, carefully chosen. And that is, of course, one of the attributes that we associate with the Obama presidency. And it, this is really his life's work having left office, how to improve this situation, this ongoing crisis, tensions between communities of color and police departments right. all across the country. And you heard him really stress that police departments have a role to play, young people have a role to play. His comments certainly right. I would agree with Joshua, focused on the young people um, and quite optimistic and making it very clear as we do approach an election year uh, that everyone has a role to right. play. Cornell, you and I are the old guys in this in this quartet here, I'm just warning you. Um, and I want to put up some polling numbers here because I think, I felt like President Obama was getting at this. I mean, look at the Monmouth poll and I want to put up some changes here just on the issue of are police more likely to use excessive force against black suspects? You know, white America four years ago was only about 25% thought that. Now it's up to 50% of, of white America. Uh, it's 87% of black America, but 57% overall. So the point is, it does seem as the biggest change, frankly, just between Ferguson and today is among white America on this issue. And, and, that's, the, and that's the power of, of, of what we're seeing in this movement right now. And that's the power of what you're seeing there on the ground with those protesters, that, that, that diverse swath of America. They're not just African-Americans, they're, they're, they're younger white people, they're, they're, they're Latinx, they're, they're Asians. It is a diverse swath of America. And, and I've said this before, Chuck, the moment that, that white people think they have skin in the racism game, game change in America. And I think yep. this is different because we are actually seeing more whites think all of a sudden, racism is something that does, in fact, impact me. It does, in fact, impact my community. And certainly this division is problematic for my children down, down the line. So I think this is going to be different. And I think the opportunity to, to mobilize this and to, and to change and not be tribalized by this you see it in what's happening, and you see it on those young, on the, those young people in the street, by the way. And those young people in the street, Chuck, look an awful lot like the core of the Obama coalition that yeah, we organized yeah. in 2008, 2012. And so many of them protested their vote in 2016 and didn't come out or vote a third party. 
I'm curious, Cornell, how much do you think that the combination of the impact of the pandemic, both on health and economics, coupled with the police, the examples of police brutality and abuse again showing up at the same time, almost was like a, you can't ignore this now, white America. <laughs> it was a perfect storm. It, it was a perfect yeah. storm of, 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 of angst. But also, Chuck, look, that video, and I've been hit up by, you know, I'm a proud political hack and I work in politics, but I've been hit up by Republican consultants who say, you know, this is just, I can't believe this. This is not America. I can't. So for, for, for the first time, they're seeing it in ways that we've been arguing about it for, 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 for a long time. So I think this is different because, again, you do have, this is, this is and look, even Mitch McConnell, it, which, which I can't believe, even talked about on this, talked about what can Congress do about this now. So this does feel different. Uh, it was interesting, um, Joshua Johnson, that I, I thought the president, it, he, former President Obama was careful. He talked about that he had this 21st century policing program, and he didn't mention that, that it was this administration that got rid of it. I mean, it's implied, um, but I thought that was interesting. He, was, he stopped short of doing that. Well, yeah, but why? I mean, what do you gain by saying it? Like... I, I, I don't know. What do you I make understand of what you're what you're getting at. I mean, well, I understand what you're getting at. I mean, when he gave that virtual commencement address that aired here on MSNBC and elsewhere, there was that kind of sideways swipe at the Trump administration. But yeah, it's it's kind of it's almost too late in a day for that. Like, if this is going to change, it's going to change because a critical mass of everybody is going to make it change. And I think he knows how important this is and how this cuts across political lines, especially with young people. If there's one thing about 21st century teenagers and 20-somethings that is dramatically different from their parents, regardless of their party, it is they are highly, mm -hmm. highly pragmatic. They are far more pragmatic than partisan. And so if he says something like that, like, well, you know, the Trump administration threw away my plan, but we should do it anyway, it instantly right. robs it of its ability to just be a good idea. Young people that I've encountered with, and I agree with President Obama that young people should give you hope. The reason they give you hope yep. is because they're pragmatic, and no matter whether it's this picture we're looking at in Philadelphia, which I think is in Fishtown, or anywhere across the country that's been protesting, you give them a good idea, and even young people of different political stripes will be able to say, well, explain it. Let, let me ask you questions. Let me pick this apart, and let me Google this, and let me go to Snopes to see if this has been debunked, and then we can talk. But at least they're not going to say, are you a jet or are you a shark? Like, we've seen how far that's gotten us politically. Spoiler alert, it's gotten us nowhere. And today's young people are much more willing to just focus on an idea that works. Kristen Walker, I, we did hear today from Speaker Pelosi, we have an idea for the first bill that would come out of the House on police reform, possibly a ban, some sort of attempt to put a ban on chokeholds. Now, whether it's done via making it a federal crime or using money to coerce local police departments to change is, is unclear. It sounded like what I thought was interesting about uh, the former president's remarks is he was basically saying, hey, this is done on the local level. Don't expect the federal government to make a, a, a change on its own. He didn't say it in those terms, but he was emphasizing this is about mayors and county executives. That's right, and that was at the crux of his 21st century policing policies. And you're right, I mean, the conversation you're having with Joshua, the president didn't mention the fact that the Trump administration essentially rolled back or abandoned those policy prescriptions. He didn't have to for all of the reasons that, that Joshua is talking about, and also because top Obama advisors are doing that work. Democrats are doing that work. They have been pointing out the fact that uh, former President Obama's policy prescriptions have not been enacted and that that is some of what they think is useful 
in terms of dealing with this type of a crisis. But you're absolutely right. Obama made this very much a local issue. And that was at the yep. core of so many of those suggestions, that it's about community policing and enhancing that, that it's about providing police officers with the tools and the training that they need, whether it's right. body cameras or learning how to interact in a more effective way with the communities that surrounding them. It's about giving young boys and young men of color the resources that they need in order to thrive and that all of that stuff happens at the local level. I also think it's worth noting, Chuck, we may be getting a glimpse of what specifically we're going to see from Obama once the campaign really right. does start to ramp out, up, that he sees himself yeah. as someone who can help to frame the terms of this type of debate. Well, he's let's um let's dip back in uh both the former attorney general has taken another question i think we're about to see some questioning of former president obama so let's listen in i want to move now to philippe cunningham who is a councilman from the city of minneapolis where so much of this is centered minneapolis is really ground zero in so many ways as it was home to george floyd and his family Philippe, I have so many questions for you, but first, I want to know how you're doing and what is happening on the ground in Minneapolis. You know, I see here on the Zoom call my friend Deion Jones, who is peacefully protesting in Los Angeles when he was hit with the rubber bullet. And we've seen so many images of that kind of unnecessary confrontation, and a lot of them, unfortunately, are coming from Minneapolis. So how is home? How is the home team doing? And what do we, we outside of Minneapolis need to understand about what's going on on the ground? Yes, well, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for that question. Um, I, too, just want to start off with naming that I'm here today because of the strength of my ancestors and elders who came before me fighting the fight to make my existence and work as an elected official possible. So on the ground in Minneapolis, folks are mobilizing on a scale we've never seen before. And a diverse coalition, a very diverse coalition of folks is emerging demanding justice not only for George Floyd, but justice in how the city of Minneapolis protects its residents. What we are seeing right now from folks on the ground is, in Minneapolis and across the country is generations of trauma and rage at the violence bestowed on and on the black community and the dis disinvestment of the black, black community by the state at every single level of government. And I'll just add that I myself, um, as a black, queer, transgender man, I too live firsthand both the trauma and uh, the trauma that I have to carry around experiencing the wit and witnessing state sanctioned violence, as well as the generational trauma of my ancestors who have su who survived slavery. So seeing all of this layering it on, what's interesting about the fact that all of this has really been ground zero in Minneapolis is that we are an incredibly progress progressive city. At the same time, we are also the city that has the most significant racial disparities between white and black folks in the entire country across every indi indicator of quality of life. So this has just been boiling under the surface. Uh, I've been in office now for two and a half years. Uh, and within my first two years, I had to deal with three officer-involved shooting deaths in my ward alone, including one that was a suicide by cop. The trauma from those, from those incidents doesn't just dissipate because the legal system deems their deaths justified. The evidence is clear overall. Uh, President Obama spoke to uh, the data that we're starting to see um, over policing, criminalization, and mass incarceration have not kept our communities safer. In fact, people getting caught in the criminal justice system further disenfranchises black and brown folks, pushing us further to the margins of society due to criminal histories, thus triggering a cycle of involvement with crime in the criminal justice system that is often passed intergenerationally. So what we're seeing on the ground in Minneapolis is folks saying enough is enough. And our system is obviously broken and it's time for a new system of public safety in our city. Over the years, we have heard from folks who believe that the solution is simply adding more police officers. And we've also heard from folks who are reformers who want to advocate for incremental change. But even those voices right now are waning because our whole city has seen 
for the past three nights that we have the ability to keep ourselves safe and our community safe. So you ask how I'm doing, I'll say I'm a little bit tired because I've been up all night with my community, organizing my community uh, very closely with folks on the ground to post up patrol because Minneapolis Police Department nor the National Guard um, were showing up to protect our homes and our small businesses. We're seeing large scale protests, what folks are seeing on the media right now, the protests and riots in South Minneapolis, we see that. But in North Minneapolis, the historically black community in Minneapolis, where I represent, we've been dealing with far right wing and white supremacist groups terrorizing our community by burning down black owned businesses. So we've come together, protected our own community, and now it's time for us to systematize community led safety strategies and make them sustainable. For so much that you said, and, and and couldn't agree with you more on all. We've been of listening. It. That was actually Philippe Cunningham, who is a uh, a local elected official in Minneapolis, giving you sort of a lay of the land from his perspective. There, we're going to sneak in a quick commercial break, and we will dip. If you are looking for more opportunity in order to move up, you have to start there. Yeah. So, Juan, what what about that when it comes to the policies? Because that that is a fact. Most of these cities that are experiencing these problems are liberal-ran cities. Right, they're, they're run by Democrats, uh, if that's what you're saying. I mean, I think it's important to understand it gets partisan and politicized so quickly, but many of these cities exist in terms of larger corporate structures, employment. Dana talked about failed education systems, public education systems. Uh, you know, that's why I'm a strong supporter of charter schools. We need innovation there. But I don't think it's just that. I mean, I think it's, you know, you have Republicans, Democrats, uh, independents who are involved in a structure that has historical roots that are systemic and that have done tremendous damage to racial unity or the possibility of racial unity in the United States. And I think we should try to get away from the partisanship and try to look at it honestly. All right, Greg and Jesse, uh, we'll get to you on the other side of the break. One more thing is up next. Two hours, we did see most of the peaceful protesters leave at 8 o'clock yesterday, uh, and that's the plan today. What happens after 8 o'clock is some of the other people, some of the agitators who come out and start trouble. So we'll see, we're two hours away from that wolf. And if you look at the faces, as uh, former President Obama said, so many young people have been activated to deal with this uh, crisis that's unfolding in the United States right now. And he says that is so, so encouraging. We're going to have a lot more on all of the breaking news unfolding here in the United States. Uh, the demonstrations are continuing. You're looking at live pictures now coming in from Los Angeles. Much more of our special coverage right after this. Believing, keep being strong, keep supporting the people. Our insurance, so you won't. Infections are common, or if you do it, only pay for what you need. Liberty, 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 liberty. Because there is some real momentum here. We, like I said, we've heard since I've been in office, I've heard from so many folks who are just like the only. The way we solve this problem is by just adding more police. If we just add more police, that will solve the problem. Or if we implement these specific reforms, body cams, um, diversifying the police department, anti-bias training, that sort of, those sort of reforms, then we'll see the outcomes. Um, but we really need to dig even deeper into it. And what we're seeing is a groundswell of demands for the city of Minneapolis to defund the police. That's what we're seeing right now. These folks are the ones who are transformation oriented. And so the, in Minneapolis, uh, the public and political will right now are very concentrated at this point in transformational change. And things have also changed in that who is in elected office here. I'm actually not the only black trans person on Minneapolis City Council. A lot of folks don't realize that. There, uh, my sister, uh, Council Vice President Andrea Jenkins, is also on the Minneapolis City Council, um, and she's a powerhouse. Activists and organ organizers have allies with the same vision for equity and justice who are in office now. So that really opens the possibility when we all work together. 
So I would say that we're, we're starting to, to, to dive into it. The state's uh, Minnesota Department of Human Rights has opened an investigation into the police department for the last 10 years for um, systemic racial discrimination. So I would say uh, what we need right now is for folks outside of Minneapolis to keep an eye on what's going on and also to invest in the folks, the organizations who are on the ground who have been doing this work for years and years um, and to also push folks on the ground here, communities, to make their voices heard. That is one of the biggest things is that I hear the most from the folks just simply want more police. I have been labeled soft on crime because of the fact that I act. Donald Trump or Joe Biden or anything like that. This has to do with executive leadership in local communities as pushed by the resident. So Ferguson, I'm not sure I'd use the word optimistic. I think, right. you know, you got to have a dream, but also you got to put that dream to work because we know as black people how good the promises of elected officials have been when we have not pushed and pushed and pushed again. I'm, I'm low on time here, Kristen Welker, and you're well aware of that, but you grew up in Philadelphia and, and you grew up and you watched that transition in Philadelphia as well. Philadelphia would go the other way at times when it came to, to uh, certain instincts. Um, think Frank Rizzo. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Frank Rizzo and they, some of the protesters, in fact, tore the statue of the former mayor of Philadelphia down because uh, they saw him as a symbol of someone who only added to these types of racial tensions. And I was in Philadelphia, Chuck, when uh, Charles Ramsey was the police commissioner and really made that the focal point of his tenure there, community policing and trying to improve and prevent the types of deaths like the one suffered by George Floyd. And of course, he went on to lead the task force uh, of former President Obama. So I think that this is something that is impacting communities all across the country. There is no doubt about that. I was out with protesters outside of the White House today, and I talked to them, and I asked them to reflect on the response that we've seen by President Trump, the comments that we've seen by Vice President Biden, who is, of course, uh, the presumptive nominee. And they said, look, no one seems to have the exact answer. This is something that we all have to fight for, Chuck. A crisis in this country. All four fired Minneapolis police officers involved in George Floyd's death now face criminal charges. The Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison making the announcement just a little while ago saying he acted in the interest of justice. The existing charges against uh, Derek Chauvin, who was already in custody, have been upgraded from third degree to second degree murder. Arrest warrants have been issued for the other three police officers ex-police officers now who are also charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder. All of them are expected to be in custody soon. We're watching to see how these new charges may impact protests across the United States as we head into a ninth night of demonstrations with curfews ordered in multiple cities from coast to coast. Let's first go to Minneapolis where George Floyd uh, took his last struggling breath. CNN's Miguel Marquez is on the scene for us. So Miguel, all four officers now charged in Floyd's death. Update our viewers, these are very historic and dramatic developments. And it certainly feels that way here. Uh, I want to show you exactly how this memorial is starting to grow. This, this mural has been added in the last couple of days. It is a, it's incredibly striking. And in the very spot where Mr. Floyd took his last breath, they've now painted an angel on the street. This news by people here met with great relief. A long-awaited decision for George Floyd's family and supporters. George Floyd mattered. He was loved. His family was important. His life had value. And we will seek justice for him and for you, and we will find it. Minnesota Attorney General Keith Ellison announcing charges for the former police officer who kneeled on George Floyd's neck, killing him, will be increased to second-degree murder. And the other three former officers who either helped hold Floyd down or stood by watching have been charged with aiding and abetting second-degree murder. Ellison asking for patience as they work through the process. Trying this case will not be an easy thing. Winning a conviction will be hard, but history does show 
that there are clear challenges here. Just hours earlier, all the world is watching. George Floyd's son stood at the spot where his father took his final breath. I'm trying to get justice for my father. And no, no man or woman should, uh, should be without their fathers. And we want justice for what's going on right now. Family attorney Benjamin Crump making a powerful statement that Floyd's death shines a light on inequality everywhere. When George Floyd said, I can't breathe, because when he couldn't breathe, none of us could breathe. And so we, this is a tipping point. Earlier today, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz visited the same hallowed ground. For me, I have to personally and viscerally feel this. I don't think we get another chance to fix this in the country. I really don't. And as protesters take to the streets across the country today, last night's protest remained largely peaceful. But as curfews passed in some cities, there was once again unrest. CNN cameras were there as looting continued in New York and in Lafayette Park across from the White House, where after mostly peaceful protests, police used pepper spray through the fence directly at our camera. Press, press. But in many cities, protesters and police came together. In New Orleans, police officers took a knee with protesters. In Boston, too, and in Houston, a protester praying with the police chief. Amen. Amen. But as George Floyd's family continues to grieve, she wanted to know how he died. And the only thing that I can tell is, Breathe. Their hope that his death will bring change. That's right, that change will work. Wait, wait, wait. 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 And that that sense of change, that sense of hope is apparent here. This is the corner of 38th Street in Chicago. This is just a few feet from where I was before. This whole area has become hallowed ground. It's also become sort of a community space where they're bringing in water, food. Uh, barbecue, pampers, everything that one might need in their household. It has become a sort of place of celebration today, but also a, a place where they feel safe, especially during the recent uh, crackdown here and the curfews. People have been staying here all night, protecting this area, protecting this, making sure that this place is okay. The one thing that they are waiting for now is to see this process play out. The Attorney General here in Minnesota asking for more time they will give it to him for now, but uh, they, they will be waiting for more results. Well, yeah, the uh, Attorney General of Minnesota, Keith Ellison, telling me uh, in the last hour, this uh, process, these trials of these ex-police officers could go on for months right now. It's not a matter of days or weeks, for months. All right, stand by, Miguel. Uh, we're going to continue to get reaction to all the breaking news that we're following. I want to go to our Chief White House correspondent, Jim Acosta. Jim, ahead of these uh, charges in Minnesota, President Trump apparently, we're told, was stewing about new remarks by Defense Secretary Esper. Tell us about that. Uh, that's right, Wolf. Uh, White House officials are stopping short tonight of saying President Trump has confidence in Defense Secretary Mark Esper. Earlier this morning, Secretary Esper tried to distance himself from the president's threats to use active duty U.S. troops on American soil to quell these protests in American cities. Esper said that kind of a deployment should only be used as a last resort and that the U.S. has not reached that point yet and his assessment and here's more of what secretary esper had to say i did know that following the president's remarks on monday evening that many of us were going to join president trump and review the damage in lafayette park and at st john's episcopal church what i was not aware of was exactly where we were going when we when we arrived at the church and what the plans were once we got there i was not aware of a photo op was happening now, that was Secretary Esper there claiming he did not know that the president was going on a photo op at St. John's Episcopal Church on Monday and only found out as he was walking with Mr. Trump across Lafayette Square after the park was cleared by police and National Guard forces, an operation that included the use of chemical agents on protesters. The White House says Esper's claim is false that he didn't know he was joining the president on that photo op. Well, you also asked uh, the press secretary, Jim, about that ugly scene outside the White House Monday night that unfolded live on our air. Uh, do they still think it was a good idea to do what they did at 
remove uh, those peaceful protesters the way they did? Uh, no regrets, Wolf. Uh, not one bit. Uh, White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany defended the brutal tactics employed to clear out the park, including the use of those chemical agents that meet the definition of tear gas, according to the CDC. We have the definition right here. Uh, McEnany tried to hide behind claims from the U.S. Park Police that officers didn't use tear gas and that protesters were acting violently, and that's why the officers responded the way they did. But the pepper balls used by the officers are tear gas-like weapons, and here's more of what she had to say when I pressed her on this. If the White House president and his team had to do it all over again, would you have gassed and pummeled protesters to clear the park so the president could have a photo op? So let me first address, no tear gas was used and no rubber bullets no were, used. were used. So again, no tear gas was used, no rubber bullets were used. Others say they were tear gassed in that area. No one was tear gassed, let me make that clear. That's been confirmed by DOD and by no Park Services as well. And the press secretary also tried to try to the president's photo op at the church to the late Prime Minister uh, Sir Winston Churchill's visits to bombed out sections of London during World War II, but of course, well, Winston Churchill was visiting those neighborhoods in London uh, to check on bombing survivors and survey the damage. Uh, the president went to St. John's Episcopal Church to hold up a Bible, uh, two very different things and a very lofty comparison, uh, nonetheless, from the White House, uh, a comparison that I think really fell uh, on deaf ears and, and struck a sour note in that briefing room earlier today. We almost just couldn't believe that the press secretary was making that kind of comparison. Uh, the president uh, held up a Bible uh, over at that church. It's nothing like when Winston Churchill was surveying uh, bombing damage during World War II. Yeah, uh, absolutely. All right, Jim Acosta uh, at the White House standby. Uh, I want to bring in the Houston Police Chief uh, Art Acevedo. Uh, and the rest is history. Isn't that amazing? Well, in the area. The place where you and your family want to be. It appears that the group is doing a prayer right now. That's one of the vigils, one of at least the three different memorials here at this intersection where George Floyd died over a week ago. And, you know, one thing that you continue to hear from people who come here to not only pay their respects but to advocate and have that advocacy is the push for more, not just the arrest of the officers, not even just the conviction of the officers, but for systemic reform. And it's that reform that they feel like they're starting to get. Yesterday we heard from the governor of the state, the governor of Minnesota, who actually came here this morning to pay his respects. He's filing that civil charge against the Minneapolis Police Department, not just looking at this case, but going back 10 years at the patterns and practices of that department. That's what people here are calling for. They say that this is a moment beyond the specifics of this case, but they believe this is a moment where there can be true change. All right? Uh, Shaquille, thank you. I want to go right to Washington, where MSNBC's Garrett Haake is again at his reporting position outside of the White House, where we've seen a range of events over different nights. What are you seeing now? Harry, my reporting position has been moved back about 70 yards from where it's been the last couple of days. That's because uh, federal law enforcement have pushed out into the street uh, sometime overnight last night with the help of National Guard and federal officials who throughout the day have refused to identify themselves, uh, but who we believe are with the U.S. Bureau of Prisons here helping with the federal response. They've shut down this street uh, just a block from the White House on 16th Street. All day today we've seen hundreds of protesters. If you've been with me a few minutes earlier this entire street would have been full but a lot of the folks have left and turned the corner onto I Street to march we believe towards the Capitol that tends to be the way this goes these protests in DC are kind of an organic thing they build up with big crowds and they march out into the streets then they inevitably return here to the White House here in DC the curfew has been extended tonight till 11 p.m. 7 p.m. last night although it was not particularly enforced. We had a large peaceful protest into the night here. And Ari, one bit of news, just in the seconds before I came on the air, I saw a statement from the U.S. Park Police, who are of course the main agency involved in clearing H Street, clearing the park for the president the other night. They said two officers have been placed on administrative leave while they investigate the incident caught on tape of them uh, attacking an Australian news crew that was caught on tape, proof that the cameras on at these events uh, hopefully does in fact make a difference. Uh, thank you, Garrett. I want to turn right to our experts now that we've gotten certain way usually occurs after uh, nightfall um, so during the day we usually see the non-violent uh, protests occurring 
Uh, and then when it gets to the night, we see the more violent protests starting to happen, uh, criminals starting to take place, uh, organized, loosely organized during the day to achieve a, a specific goal. So is there an effort to go after the leaders of this um, effort? I mean, is it, can you see it across states? Is it organized uh, in different cities across the country? And is there an effort to target who's responsible and who's financing it as well? Yeah, absolutely. I think what we're seeing right now, it's loosely organized within a metropolitan city. Um, as it being, is it being organized across the country in an organized way? I don't think that we see that yet, but again, we're continuing to analyze the intelligence and really getting the feedback from the state and local law enforcement officials in these individual cities. So we'll, we'll continue to look at, we are partnering, we have a number of investigators at the department that are working with DOJ and working with FBI. We know that they've opened up a number of cases specifically targeting some of the leaders uh, of Antifa and other organizations that are involved. So I know they're already going down that path. The department uh, is a strong partner with DOJ, and again, we have assets, we have investigators that are helping the Department of Justice in that. Where is uh, the COVID situation right now? Uh, we're seeing all of these protests, we're seeing a lot of people gathering together. I know your department also dealt with the, the situation with COVID-19. If you look at the U.S. coronavirus daily new cases, uh, the kind of the rolling average and the new cases uh, graphic, you can see that it's kind of rolling down and a little bit of a spike. But what, what about that in context to all of this? Sure. I think overall, I think we're still on a downward trend. We see a number of states and localities continuing to open up. The economy is continuing to open up. So whether you're in phase one or phase two or, or somewhere in between, I think we're seeing progress there. I think it's very important that we open up that economy uh, and we do so in a safe and responsible way. And we've put out guidelines, White House Coronavirus Task Force has put out guidelines on how to reopen uh, the economy and, and provided those resources to state governors and, and other officials there. So we continue to uh, look at that. Uh, I think as we look at the civil unrest over the last several days and we see these large groups, um, I think we see a lot of mass, but uh, obviously we're not doing the social distancing that we've been talking about over the last several months. So that's a little concerning to, to a variety of us. Uh, and we'll have to see if there's any impact, long-term impact to that. But I think overall we're on the right trajectory, uh, downward trajectory, uh, but we still have got to do a number of things across the country uh, continuing to mitigate, continuing to do some of that social distancing, uh, but we've got to do so in a responsible manner. But one, that we've got to get the economy back up and running. We need to open up back America. I think the president's been very clear about that, and we'll continue to do that, and we're on the right path. There's a piece by James Mattis, the first uh, defense secretary for uh, President Trump, uh, in which he's writing, uh, some pretty stark language. Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite the American people, does not even pretend to try. Instead, he tries to divide us. And we're witnessing the consequence of three years of this deliberate effort. That's from uh, General Jim Mattis. Your thoughts on that uh, tonight? Well, I think if you look at the remarks that the president made, whether he made it uh, down in Florida uh, shortly after the launch, made it in the Rose Garden, made it a couple of different places, I think his language has been very specific uh, regarding the tragic events in Minneapolis, uh, what he thinks about that, uh, but it has also been very clear about law and order, uh, the rule of law, and needing to establish that. So I, I know the media likes to focus on uh, some harsh words and some direct words uh, that can be delivered at times, and I think that's needed at times. Uh, but I, I encourage the American people and really everyone to look at his comments as a whole, and I think you will see that they have been balanced and he has taken the right tone regarding the events in Minneapolis, but making sure uh, he's going to stand up to, for law and order. He's going to stand up for the law enforcement officials that are being targeted over the last several days, and I think that's the right approach, uh, and the President's been very clear on that. Mr. Secretary, we appreciate your time tonight. Right, thank you. In tonight's Democracy 2020 report, new Fox polls indicate Joe Biden leads President Trump in three major battleground states, Wisconsin. Registered voters prefer the Democrat by nine percentage points. The margin is four in Arizona, two in Ohio. Also tonight, Republicans are now seeking a new home for this summer's nominating convention for real, not just talking about it. Here's correspondent Peter Ducey. In all three swing states where Biden leads Trump, Arizona, Ohio, and Wisconsin, 
voters in a Fox News poll have something in common. The exact same percentage of people in each place, 65%, think it's important for President Trump to set an example and wear a mask in public. And in all three states, Biden leads with voters who say they are extremely motivated to vote in the election. This comes as another swing state, North Carolina, is losing a convention. President Trump tweets, Governor Cooper is still in shelter-in-place mode and not allowing us to occupy the arena as originally anticipated and promised. Would have showcased beautiful North Carolina to the world and brought in hundreds of millions of dollars and jobs for the state. Because of NC Governor, we are now forced to seek another state to host the 2020 Republican National Convention. Some being considered, Florida, Georgia, Tennessee, and Nevada. One of them gets the high profile events like the president accepting the nomination. Charlotte just keeps the convention's official business meetings and Republicans there say that's devastating. Vehicles, experience. Good. 2000 opera. Into the evening hours, they kind of dissipate because you don't know that watch only goes into effect until eight o'clock central time. So those storms are expected to die out. In mind. In a Facebook post Wednesday, the South Dakota State Fair announced they will continue to plan for this year's fair. The state fair manager says that this year's fair could look a little different from past years. However, they don't know what those differences may be. The fair is prepared for some various scenarios, but they are keeping the health and safety of everyone top priority. You can learn more from the fair manager about this year's fair by visiting this Kevaland.com original online right now. His rhetoric and his tone and everyone thought he would pivot and he would become more presidential and it seems to have gone the other way rather than rising to the occasion, rising to meet the challenges of the office, he has brought the office down and he is at not acting in accordance, not even to a president, not even to a leader, not even to someone who is elected even to the lowest form of government. The things that come out of this president's mouth, you wouldn't want to hear it from your child. And so those are, those are the honest truths that we need to uh, face in this country, that we need to face in the media, that this isn't about some fake objectivity, some pretend thing that you have to, because the president is doing something that's unpresidential, the president is lying, the president is using the instruments of government in, in, a, wrong, in a wrong capacity. We can't sit here and pretend like, well, what is the other, uh, other side? Sometimes there is no other side. There is no other side to bigotry. There is, there, there's no fine people on both sides for every single event. Sometimes things are just right, right is right, and wrong is wrong. And you have to call this president out. So I think that especially us in the media and people who are in power like James Mattis need to, in their time, in their moment, when they have their platform, James Mattis, I respect you as a general or what have you, but you should have been doing that and speaking out and telling the president that he wasn't acting like a leader when you had power and when you were in office. Thank you for this, but more people need to speak out in the moment. Stand by, uh, Don. Uh, I, I want to bring in uh, a, an exclusive guest that we have right now, a two-time Super Bowl champion, uh, Malcolm Jenkins. He's also co-founder of Listen Up Media to help advance social awareness. He's the executive producer of a new film called Black boys. Uh, Malcolm, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, you've been a leader in this movement against pr police brutality for years now. So how does it feel to see these protests around the country, to see these four ex-police officers charged today? Yeah, I mean, you know, thank you for having me, first off. Um, I think, you know, to see what is happening around the country, the amount of people that are in the streets uh, voicing their concerns and their um, disapproval of, of the amount of uh, racial injustice that has gone against the black community for centuries, people have had enough and they're tired of doing things that the, the way that you know, people want to and they are demanding that things change right now. And I think the amount of the overwhelming pressure that is, that is building up um, gives us a real opportunity and real hope that now is the time that we can actually change and radically change the fabric of this country, the trajectory uh, of our black communities, but really the soul of America and, and really stand firm and actually believe in the things that we promised through our constitution uh, and, and what the American dream is. 
you, you, you wrote a piece uh, in the Philadelphia Inquirer, Malcolm, uh, and, and you said that, and I'm quoting now, being black in the eyes of far too many police officers means my dignity and my life are not worth protecting. So what steps are you pushing for right now from local officials when it comes to accountability? I think we just uh, lost our connection with Malcolm uh, Jenkins, the two-time Super Bowl champ. Uh, he's got very strong words. We're going to try to reconnect with him uh, because uh, uh, I want our viewers here in the United States and around the world to hear his words. Let's reconnect with Malcolm Jenkins. We'll take a quick break. Much more of our special coverage coming up. These are live pictures. Please. Invoke. For tomorrow, partly to mostly sunny and warm, a nice day, low to mid 80s, but then thunderstorms ramping up during the afternoon could be strong or severe. Thank, thanks, Jay. Thank you for joining us. Breaking news tonight, all four officers charged. After eight days of nationwide anger over the death of George Floyd, former officer Derek Chauvin now faces a new, more severe charge, murder in the second degree. The three other fired officers charged with aiding and abetting murder. Tonight, the punishment they could face and whether the Floyd family believes it's enough. America reacts. Crowds erupt following the announcement of the charges. We got a war! As thousands of demonstrators march in cities across the country, including in Washington, D.C., which has seen a heavy military presence. Testing tens of thousands in the street at this hour across this nation. And we hear from many as they learn of the charges against the other officers. Hundreds laying face down in the nation's capital. The mayor of Philadelphia taking down a controversial statue overnight. There are breaking developments involving President Trump and his defense secretary. Secretary Mark Esper publicly breaking from the president saying he does not support using active duty troops against American citizens. And what Esper said about that photo op in front of the church with the Bible. But then late today, after all of this, a meeting with Esper at the White House. And word Esper reversing again. U.S. troops will stay in the area. On this ninth night of protests, former President Obama, just moments ago, and his new message to young men and women of color, I want you to know that you matter. Overseas tonight, the massive protests in London, thousands marching over the death of George Floyd, the huge crowd outside 10 Downing Street, Molotov cocktails pulled at the U.S. Embassy in Athens, and Pope Francis, in a rare move, mentioning George Floyd by name. This is ABC World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening, and it's great to have you. Million dollars. Prosecutors are also charging the three other officers who were at the scene of Floyd's death with aiding and abetting murder. Attorney General Keith Ellison said late today that getting a conviction would be difficult, but he vowed to seek justice. Video of Chauvin kneeling on George Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes set off a firestorm nationwide, sparking protests that continued overnight and throughout the day today. And while most of those demonstrations, including a moment of silence here in Washington, have been largely peaceful, curfews remain in effect tonight in several major cities, including New York, D.C., and L.A. And tensions are still high as we come on the air with National Guard troops on the ground in 31 states. An active duty military on standby at bases ringing the nation's capital. That's also leading to a standoff between the president and his defense secretary, Mark Esper, who says he doesn't support using troops to... ...at value. At the same time, he said that convicting police officers is difficult. Late today, former President Obama and his new message to young men and women of color in this country, and there are also breaking developments at this hour involving President Trump and his defense secretary. We'll guide you through it all again tonight, and we're going to begin with these with Malcolm Jenkins uh, of the New Orleans Saints who's got very strong words on all of this. We'll see if we can fix that. But the demonstrations, peaceful demonstrations, right now are continuing around the United States. People are gathering. Even as restaurants welcome diners again in the Windy City for outside dining only, business owners say they're not out of the woods. We've been uh, trying to, to be resilient and be uh, trying to stay strong and being positive for the, for the future. 
but for the time being, it's just that day in and day out, trying to grind it out. In Chicago, uh, retail stores can reopen today at 50% capacity, but here on the things, obviously, from a moral dimension, and you and you teach about God. And sometimes in our discourse and in the media, you know, we, we shy away from that, and people have different beliefs. Uh, but when you think about that and God, what does it mean to you that we are living in a time of extreme death? This pandemic is all around us. Uh, it has not been an equal opportunity killer, but it has touched so many. And then within that, we see the killing, which Minnesota authorities now describe as an alleged charged murder. How do you see that interacting? Because we're dealing with this time of death, Reverend. Well, death can have, especially death in the movement, can have the potential of destroying you and making you doubt and go into utter despair, or death can spur you. Like the death of Emmett Till spurred uh, Rosa Parks. It was the death of Swana Cheney and Goodman that made more people go south, not less. It was the death of four girls in a Birmingham church 17 days after the march on Washington, and then the death of a president that pushed people to do more. Sometimes what death does is it makes people say, wait a minute, our systems are failing us. We may die, but we shouldn't die like this, and so we're going to resist the death. Like Claude McKay said in his book back in the Hall of Renaissance, if we must die, let us not die like hogs. And so what's happening is people are saying, this is not supposed to happen. The state is not supposed to kill you. The state is not supposed to keep you from having PPEs. The state is not supposed to take your health care. The state is not supposed to force you back to work in lethal situations like Trump did with meat packers. And certainly the state in your name is not supposed to murder somebody right in your face. Sometimes when death, that kind of death happens, it actually brings people to life. It's almost like a crucifixion and then there's a resurrection. I was reading a scripture in Amos um, that actually says, um, God says, I'm looking for the day when a remnant of people will go in the streets and shut down the malls and shut down the businesses and cry and wail until the nation pays attention. It's in Amos chapter 5 in the Message Bible. Some of that is what we're seeing in this moment. Mm. Mm. Thank you. American made cup phone or desk phone. So let's get to Alex Perez in Minneapolis again tonight at that growing memorial there behind you. Uh, so powerful to hear from his little girl and Alex late today. The state attorney general did make a point of saying that prosecuting officers is always difficult. Yeah, David, he said extremely difficult, but they say with the evidence they are collecting right now, they feel they have a case, they are building a case where they will be able to get a conviction. This community here, David, now preparing for that big memorial tomorrow afternoon. David? Alex Perez with us again tonight. Thank you, Alex. And as we said, protesters are taking to the streets across America tonight for a ninth day now, expressing anger but also hope. And tonight we hear what they have to say after learning that the other officers have now been charged. And the message late today for young men and women of color in this country from President Obama saying, I want you to know that your lives matter. ABC's Stephanie Ramos here in New York. This is now the ninth night of protest since the killing of George Floyd. Thousands protesting racism and police brutality. Calling for charges for all of the officers involved. Tonight, word reaching protesters. What do you think about the charges that the officers, or former officers, are now facing? Now, now, it took protest. It took cities burning for you to arrest four people. I'm so happy. I, I still think it's not enough, but I'm so happy that we're moving towards change because a few years ago, I don't think this would have happened. Large crowds turning out today from New York to Los Angeles to the U.S. Capitol, where protesters lied face down in silence in remembrance of George Floyd. The crowd urging Capitol Police to take a knee. For days, protesters in Philadelphia have tried to tear down this controversial statue of former mayor and police commissioner Frank Rizzo, widely accused of being a symbol of racism for his tactics against the black community in the 1960s and 70s. The city taking it down in the middle of the night. This is the beginning of the healing process in our city. 
Um, this is not the end. We have a long way to go. As word of those new charges reached George Floyd's brother in New York, he joined New York's police commissioner, vowing to press for change. We're moving in the direction of justice, and that's a good thing. But we must continue to keep the conversation going. Late today, former President Barack Obama making his first on-camera comments about George Floyd and the protests. You, you've communicated a sense of urgency uh, that is as powerful and as transformative as anything that I've seen uh, in recent years. At this point, David, protesters tell me they have no intention of stopping these demonstrations. They have told me every single day that they just want racism to end. They call the charges against the officers today a step, but certainly not a victory, David. Stephanie Ramos in New York again tonight. Stephanie, thank you. A bottles play. Of developments, Paula. Extraordinary indeed. Nora, Secretary Esper's decision to publicly disagree with President Trump over the use of active duty military did not go over well inside the White House. President Trump and his defense secretary are at odds tonight over the decision to call up active military to police protests. The option to use active duty forces in a law enforcement role should only be used as a matter of last resort and only in the most urgent and dire of situations. We are not in one of those situations now. The president disagrees. Called nearly 1,600 active duty soldiers now staging at four bases outside Washington. A decision to send them home today was called off, according to a U.S. official, because of the potential for more violence. You have to have a dominant force. Maybe it doesn't sound good to say it, but you have to have a dominant force. We need law and order. The show of force in cities like Washington has been called excessive by critics. Some of those heavily armed personnel wear no uniforms, signifying who they work for. A surprising sight on the streets today, DEA agents, who by law can only deal with drug-related crimes. But Attorney General Bill Barr has granted them extraordinary powers, saying that for the next 14 days, they can conduct covert surveillance and protect against threats to public safety. Meanwhile, the White House continues to defend the violent removal of protesters from Lafayette Park, allowing the president to walk to St. John's Church for a photo op. White House Press Secretary Kayleigh McEnany compared it to iconic moments during World War II and 9-11. And like Churchill, we saw him inspecting the bombing damage. It sent a powerful message of leadership to the British people and George W. Bush uh, throwing out the ceremonial first pitch after 9-11. Defense Secretary General James Mattis, who has not publicly criticized the president in the 18 months since he resigned, issued a statement late today denouncing President Trump as a threat to the Constitution and suggested that he is trying to divide Americans. Nora. Incredible to hear that from General Mattis. Uh, Paula, thank you. And as he left office, former President Barack Obama said he would only speak out publicly if he believed the nation's core values were at stake. That moment came today when Obama used a virtual town hall to urge young people to channel their anger into political action. CBS's Ed O'Keefe reports tonight from Washington. All of the nation's living former presidents have now weighed in on the death of George Floyd. Former President Barack Obama did so today, directly addressing police brutality and, and those it affects. Too often, some of that violence has come uh, from folks who were supposed to be serving and protecting you. Um, I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that your lives matter, that your dreams matter. The former president also said he's encouraged by the diversity of Americans protesting in the streets. There is a change in mindset that's taking place, a greater recognition that we can do better. Mr. Obama's comments follow remarkably frank statements from his predecessors. Former President George W. Bush, whose relationship with black Americans was strained by the federal response to Hurricane Katrina, said he was, quote, anguished by the brutal suffocation of George Floyd. Former President Bill Clinton, who enjoyed strong support from African Americans, said no one deserves to die the way Floyd did. And the truth is, if you're white in America, the chances are you won't. And former President Jimmy Carter said today that as a white male of the South, I know all too well the impact of segregation and injustice to African Americans. In times of crisis, presidents often lean on their predecessors for advice or to help raise awareness or charitable support. But in the last three years, President... You have
have Mr. Floyd dead, killed according to the autopsy, and all four face up to 40 years for unintentional murder. Now let's get into what this means, because we are at the beginning of a legal process, not the end. Everyone is legally, formally presumed innocent until proven guilty. So the new information is how prosecutors want to prove them guilty of murder. The theory here is called felony murder. This is a serious charge. And it's not just a murder charge, it's one that actually requires a separate and additional felony. So put the officers to the side for one minute and imagine someone goes to hold up a liquor store, felony number one. Then, in trying to commit that felony, somebody gets killed. There's your felony murder. Now, I just described a random kind of street crime. I could tell you, and we checked with several experts today, police officers are rarely charged with felony murder. This is not typically how prosecutors approach these cases, but there's been nothing typical about any of this. Now, for context, let's look at the numbers showing how often officers are even convicted of murders when there are police shootings. From 2005 on, on your screen, what you see is zeros, nothing, nada, no convictions, zero officers convicted. What has started to change, and we've been reporting on this, and just say the past five years, is you have a handful of officers convicted of murder. We checked and we didn't find many examples of convictions of felony murder. Now, the Attorney General of Minnesota is highlighting all of this today, and in addition to explaining how he's going to approach this, he argues that basically the first felony was assault of Mr. Floyd, and then obviously the killing makes for the felony murder. He also took pains to emphasize he was not responding to public pressure. I did not allow uh, public pressure to impact our decision-making process. Now, that may be true. I'm a newsreader, not a mind reader, and I can't tell you what was inside Mr. Ellison's decision-making process. But I can report for you something that you need to understand when you look at these problems and potential reform. Whatever Mr. Ellison's decision was, the main reason he's making any decision at all is yes, because of the public pressure you see on your screen, because of the public pressure you may see in your community, because of the public pressure that has been ripping across American life for the past week, because it was only pressure that changed the routine to put an independent attorney general overseeing the case in the first place. So here we are, a week after there were no charges in the case, and all of a sudden, four officers faced this very aggressive move of a felony murder prosecutorial theory. The three officers at the scene are charged with, now we're going to get into the details, quote, intentionally aiding, advising, hiring, counseling, or conspiring to kill George Floyd, to quote, cause the death of him. And the charge of Officer Chauvin was upgraded today, the complaint now noting that he, quote, left his knee on Floyd's neck even while there was force was now no longer necessary to control him. No longer necessary to control him. That's legal speak for brutality, that this was not a necessary tactic. And then it adds that Chauvin's restraint of Floyd was a substantial causal factor in the death. Now, the ongoing investigation can take months. New charges could be added or changed. The prosecutors need to collect the evidence. Securing a murder conviction is always a big deal. And as we just showed you, securing it of an officer is something that in many years doesn't happen in one single state in the entire country. Now, having walked through the breakdown, I want to bring in Maya Wiley. She is a former... Right to the greatest fault line in our society. Uh, how divisive the president can be, how divisive the times we live in are. Uh, I think people are equally divisive back to the president. But clearly for General Mathis, he reached his breaking point. And he is uncomfortable with what he's seeing. It's extraordinary that a former member of the president's cabinet would criticize the man who gave him that position in such blunt terms. Uh, it, it's a sign of the trouble that the president is in. You know, you don't want to be a president where you have such great division where you're losing former allies, especially in an election year. So I do think this is a troublesome sign of people who once supported the president. You know, the law and order pitch, the president says you have to dominate the streets, Mo. Uh, you've heard the former vice president uh, denounce uh, the rioting and the looting, uh, but obviously support protesters. Uh, the president said similar words about a peaceful protest, uh, but it seems like it's, it's kind of one versus the other uh, now. Uh, how do you see this as we get ready for this election? 
Yeah, and I think one of the, pr the challenges the president has is he says the right things about peaceful protests, but then in front of the whole world with cameras rolling, uh, authorizes uh, militarized law enforcement to, uh, to use excessive force against peaceful protesters uh, on his way to the church. So it's a real problem. Look, I get why the president is speaking about law and order. Right, I'm, I may be a Democrat, but I don't like the rioting in the streets. That needs to stop. Those people need to be, need to be fully prosecuted, but you know, not at the expense of our ability to peacefully protest. And I think where the president may be miscalculating a bit is while the tough law and order comments he may, uh, he may believe can help him politically, um, I think there's something that's a little bit more defining right now for a lot of people, and that is chaos. That is a complete and total sense of chaos in our government, where the president is trying to deal with two incredibly difficult crises with a pandemic and uh, the racial trouble and the riots. Uh, two incredibly difficult situations and can't get his hands around them, right? This seems to be getting away from our federal government. Well, and on top of that, the economy is starting to go into free fall. So the, the, the political calculus may be that law and order works, but I think there are a lot of folks out there who are just saying, I'm done with the chaos. We need a steady hand of leadership. Well, you know, that last part, the economy going to free fall, there are positive signs uh, that the, actually the job losses are less than predicted and the market really loved that today. Uh, so there may be kind of turning the That's corner. Hard. We'll yeah. see how the rest of the week looks. Here is the president uh, talking to Brian Kilmeade this morning. They burned down the church the day before. I heard how nice and wonderful the protesters were over there, really. Then why did they burn down the church the day before? They didn't use tear gas. They didn't use... They moved them out. Now, when I went, I didn't say, oh, move them out. I didn't know who was there. I figured I was going to walk right. over to the church very nearby. Most religious leaders loved it. Mara, I, you know, they didn't use tear gas. They used pepper spray pellets. Right, they used pepper all this spray. There's nuance about what was used, but they cleared them yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, they cleared them out. There was smoke in the air, and people were coughing and, and, and tearing up. Look, the president has been trying to send two messages. It's just that one is much louder than the other, the law and order message um, versus the, the healing message. He actually has a YouTube ad up today with his remarks from the space launch, which were all about healing. Um, but you don't hear that. What you hear is the tough law and order message. In terms of religious leaders loving it, there were a lot of religious leaders who criticized it, including the religious leaders whose church that is. Um, so. You know, the president is trying to have it both ways, and maybe it'll work. I mean, in the past, law and order messages have worked for Republicans and against Democrats when there are violent protests. But, you know, Mo made a really important point. Yeah, the president is not just the law, law and order president. He is the president of chaos and disruption. And that's something that people might just be exhausted by. Yeah, Aria, it was just interesting to see all of the pushback about that walk across the street. Um, obviously, from uh, even the the religious leaders from that church, but not a lot of talk about the burning church. We talked about that last night. The last word here. Yeah, can you imagine if the Tea Party surrounded the White House when President Obama was in office, and the worst elements burnt down and burnt the basement of St. John's Church across the street from the White House, and President Obama said, I want to go visit that church and they moved people away so he could visit. He would be praised by the media for sending every right message. What a hero. And you know the press would be all over those Tea Party protesters at the White House, and they would say it's entirely appropriate that the White House, the Secret Service, I'm sorry, moved the protesters so that the president could go to the church with his Bible. This is hypocrisy of the highest order. I thought, frankly, Brett, the, the president going to the church he marched for people who want to go to church. There's another part of the symbolism of that, quite important. Yeah, but okay, I, we'll but see I'm how this say. plays. Big I, picture, you thank know, you all. I, I gotta I, run, I, I gotta I, run, though. Okay. I know, right. you think it was a bad stunt and you th you've, you've made your point clear, I get it. And I, we have all sides here, but I gotta run because the commercial break's coming. When we come back, uh, some good news, the brighter side. What are athletes doing with their platforms every single day?
uh, to be able to talk to elect elected officials, to be able to put pressure on people with the amount of media that they can generate. I don't care how many people want to kneel for the national anthem and then go home and don't do anything. Because that doesn't necessarily change everything. We needed that to spark a national conversation, and it did. But the amount of guys who then took that action and put it to, or took that demonstration and pushed it toward action wasn't enough. And now right now we're challenging not only the African-American players and athletes and influencers who have a space where they can use their voices to push this forward. We're calling on our white brothers and sisters, the same guys who call us family, the same guys who talk about being a brotherhood. Where is that brotherhood when we step off the field? I heard something today where it is a joke. We talk about white people who are usually allies and who, who can sit in with, with black people. We say they're invited to the cookout. This is the cookout. This moment right here is a cookout, and we need everybody, no matter who you are, what race, background, to step up and change. And on that point, uh, I know, Malcolm, you're working on a film called Black Boys, uh, and I want to show a, a clip, uh, show our viewers a clip. Watch this. I think a lot of people are actually feeling like if they acknowledge some of these things, then they're guilty, like they did something wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. The only thing wrong that you could do is ignore it. So what role can uh, athletes, do you believe, play in the fight that is ongoing right now for social justice? Athletes have always played a role in fighting for social justice. From Tom, uh, Tony Smith and John Carlos to Muhammad Ali, it's always been part of that. And I think right now, what we're seeing is, when you play the clip from Chris Long, somebody I respect a great deal, because he came in not, uh, he wanted to be an ally, but he didn't want to be in the front, the forefront. He didn't want to take over or co-op the, the movement. He wanted to learn. And when he came along with us and see what we were doing, asked the questions, you know, he digested the information, he figured out how to be an ally and not feel guilty about what has all happened, but to feel responsible for changing it and being a part of pushing it forward. You know, Malcolm, uh, we heard from the former President Barack Obama uh, a little while ago this hour, and he had some strong words. Uh, and I want to read a, a sentence or two from what he said and get your reaction. Uh, the uh, former president said, uh, said this, I want you to know, and he was speaking to young African-American uh, people out there, uh, and he was also referring to his own two daughters. I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that your lives matter, that your dreams matter. And when I go home and look at the faces of my daughter, Sasha and Malia, and I look at my nephews and nieces, I see limitless potential that deserves to flourish and thrive. Uh, I don't know if you heard the former president's words, but he was very, very powerful, and he was upbeat that things potentially could change. Yes, I, I did. And I thought those were, were powerful words, and unfortunately, those are the same things that a lot of black parents in this country have to tell their kids, because we know that nobody else is going to tell them that. And in fact, they might learn the opposite. And so I think, hopefully, uh, in this moment, can push us to a point where not only does Barack Obama or any black parent uh, tell their kid that they're important, that their lives matter, that they have a place here, and that they're, uh, they can be individuals, but that the rest of the world reaffirms that as well. And the, uh, the former uh, president, uh, he was hopeful, he was upbeat in his words. Uh, he said that so many young people right now have been activated, they have been mobilized, uh, he sees an incredible opportunity right now for people to be awakened. And he said, this makes me feel optimistic. It makes me feel better. Uh, Malcolm Jenkins, uh, thanks uh, so much for what you're doing. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we appreciate it very much. I know you got a message for your fellow athletes out there. We'll see what happens, uh, not only with you and them, uh, but on the streets of America as we watch all these demonstrations unfold. Thanks, Malcolm, for joining us. Thanks. Thanks. Three. 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 Stop by Antenna TV anytime for TV how it was meant to be. Tonight, new charges against all four fired police officers in the killing of George Floyd. Derek Chauvin now charged with second-degree murder. Three others charged with aiding and abetting the community's emotional response. 
I won't be satisfied until I can wake up and have kids and have them not fear their lives just for being black. As Floyd's son delivers a powerful message on the eve of his father's memorial. Former President Obama speaking out for the first time about the killing of George Floyd, his message to the demonstrators, and his call for change. The massive new protests, peaceful scenes after days of violence. Tonight the crowds are growing as curfews loom. An extraordinary condemnation of the president by his former defense secretary, General James Mattis. Mattis slamming the president for turning Americans against each other. Some cities starting to resemble war zones, the militarization of police forces, and the message it sends under fire. And confronting the talk. Black parents talking to their kids about the police, protests, and this moment in America. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening. It is an answer to the passionate and desperate calls for justice that have echoed across cities large and small for more than a week over the death of George Floyd. Nine days after Floyd died under the knee of a Minneapolis police officer, that now fired officer tonight faces a more serious charge of second degree murder as three other former officers on the scene that day have now been charged with aiding and abetting murder. The news sparking a new wave of tearful emotion from so many who have marched in George Floyd's name. Minneapolis is where we start tonight with Gabe Gutierrez. At the site where George Floyd took his last breath, we shall the moment was cathartic. I think that it will be a wake-up call for the whole nation. We're here today because George Floyd is not here. The state's attorney general announcing new charges for the four officers involved in Floyd's death. Charges for fired officer Derek Chauvin were elevated to include second-degree murder. The three other officers are now charged with aiding and abetting murder. If convicted, each faces a maximum of 40 years in prison. George Floyd mattered. His life had value. And we will seek justice for him and for you. And we will find it. Since Floyd's death nine days ago, the officers or their attorneys have not publicly commented. All four were fired. But only after days of intensifying protests and the burning of a police precinct was Officer Chauvin, the one seen kneeling on Floyd's neck, arrested. Today, Floyd's 22-year-old son, Quincy Mason, visited the makeshift memorial for the first time. I am happy that all the officers have been arrested. My father have not been killed like this. We deserve justice. The family's statement to those police officers are they are just as guilty for the death of George Floyd as Officer Chauvin. They all participated. As violence has erupted across the country, Minneapolis has watched, prayed, and protested, often peacefully. It just shows that you just are working and they're actually listening to us. The anger is what many see, but below the surface, pain. Today we met Zoe Schaefer in the crowd in tears. I won't be satisfied until I can wake up and have kids and have them not fear their lives just for being black, for being darker than other people. I, it's, it's not enough. I can say it's not enough. It's not enough. It's not enough until everything changes. All of the officers are expected to be in custody tonight here. The crowd is growing. And a memorial service is scheduled for Minneapolis tomorrow, the first of several services honoring Floyd's life across three states over the next week. Lester. Yeah, Gabe, uh, I'll be joining you in Minneapolis tomorrow for special live coverage of George Floyd's uh, memorial, then nightly news and an NBC News special in primetime on America in crisis. For the first time tonight, former President Obama is speaking out about the death of George Floyd and the importance of making this a moment for real change. Our Peter Alexander has late details. Late tonight, President Obama speaking out during a virtual town hall with young people. I want you to know that you matter. I want you to know that your lives matter, that your dreams matter, and you should be able to learn and make mistakes and live a life of joy without having to worry about what's going to happen when you walk to the store or go for a jog or are driving down the street uh, or looking at some birds in a park. 
America's first black president directly addressing the families of George Floyd and other African Americans whose deaths have wounded the country. Please know that Michelle and I and the nation grieve with you, hold you in our prayers. Uh, we're committed to the fight of creating a more just nation in, in memory of your sons and daughters. The former president condemning the violence and looting in recent days urging demonstrators to channel their anger toward making a change. In some ways, as tragic as these past few weeks have been, as difficult and scary and uncertain as they've been, uh, they've also been an incredible opportunity for people to be uh, awakened. While never mentioning President Trump by name, President Obama is drawing a clear contrast between his efforts to build trust between police and communities of color after Michael Brown's killing in Ferguson, Missouri, and the current administration that he says has rolled back some of his policies. I am urging every mayor in this country to review your use of force policies with members of your community and commit to report on planned reforms. The past president who recently endorsed his former vice president, Joe Biden, reminding voters change begins at the ballot box. You have the power to make things better. You, you've communicated a sense of urgency uh, that is as powerful and as transformative as anything that I've seen uh, in recent years. And President Obama also acknowledged members of the law enforcement community who he says are just as outraged about the tragedies as the protesters themselves, including those who have marched along beside them. Lester? All right, Peter, thank you. Tonight, marches and demonstrations are again swelling in cities from coast to coast, largely peaceful as curfews loom once again. We get it all tonight from NBC's Miguel Almaguer. By taking a knee and laying down, they stood up against injustice. From Los Angeles to Manhattan and the Lincoln Memorial. Thank you for showing me something different today. Tensions cooling overnight. Thousands of passive protesters on Portland's Burnside Bridge. In Houston, peacefully chanting for change. A stark contrast to a week's worth of devastating violence. While pockets of unrest erupted later in Portland and Atlanta. <laughs> Authorities in New York crediting earlier curfews for keeping the peace. Our Ron Allen is there. A dramatically different scene here over the past 24 hours. Still huge crowds of peaceful protesters, but few reports of vandalism and looting. Police say that curfew has helped them identify and deal with those here to cause mayhem. In Los Angeles, NBC News given exclusive access to the National Guard, the last line of defense behind a weary police department. I absolutely support your justice protest. I absolutely support that. Thousands of citizen soldiers across the country who have hugged, kneeled, and held back crowds, many protecting their own streets, coming face to face with their neighbors in ways they never thought they would. We're living through history, but we also have a job here and that's to protect the people and the property of all the Californians here practicing their First Amendment right. In cities like Los Angeles, the Guard is dispatched to hotspot neighborhoods and city streets 24 hours a day. This is what the iconic Sunset Boulevard looks like right now. The call for help could come instantly. As the dust settles and cries for justice only grow stronger, a massive crowd gathered in front of the mayor's home in one of LA's most upscale neighborhoods. <coughs> In Charlotte, police are reviewing tactics used after this video posted on Facebook. Amid accusations, officers trapped peaceful protesters and fired tear gas into crowds. In Philadelphia, the city removed a statue of former Mayor Frank Rizzo, long criticized for aggressive policing of black people. Tonight, the pressure still on, with curfews extended and crowds growing. Cities across the nation are teetering on the edge of unrest. After so many peaceful protests across the nation, here in Los Angeles, the curfew starts at 9 p.m. The question now, will the peace hold? Lester? All right, Miguel, thank you. A remarkable voice of dissent tonight. The video, he was prominent. Break with the president today on the use of active duty... Uh, for everyone to see, uh, just like in any case, uh, in any uh, criminal case, uh, we will see those normal...
Thank you, um, Sha Shaquille Brewster. Thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate you great reporting. We'll see some chilling images um, from Washington, D.C. Those officers all stand there facing all those protesters. Let's go to Glenn Kirshner on this. Uh, prosecuting police officers is not easy. It's very difficult to get them prosecuted at all. So that's uh, one thing that is different here. Uh, but let me let you listen to uh, Attorney General Ellison on the, on the reason why. Because we deliver your. Uh, and, and free speech, and it's something that we feel uh, is at, at the center of who we are as a, as a city and state. Uh, the challenge, of course, on Saturday is what happens when that when those nonviolent protests become violent. And and I and, and I fear I fear that the great discussion that was emerging. We started hearing voices last week that never talked about social justice, never talked about racial equity, never talked about um, systemic issues in, in, in policing. Last week, actually, start talking about them and, and speaking in, 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 in words that reflect what my faith tradition teaches: love, grace, and mercy. And, and, I, and I, I believe that the events over the, over the weekend in several cities, uh, including ours, kind of took us off track. And my goal has been to pull us back on track and make sure we continue having those important discussions. I read that um, you met. <laughs> Uh, of anyone when there's a, a case involving a, a police officer is that it is an uphill climb. I'm glad that uh, Ellison is being honest with the public about uh, the charges, but also about the, the fight ahead. And I know accounts are what provoked him to stage that controversial photo op at a nearby church. The White House press secretary today comparing it to world leaders' responses to World War II and the September 11th attacks. And like Churchill, we saw him inspecting the bombing damage. It sent a powerful message of leadership to the British people. And George W. Bush uh, throwing out the ceremonial first pitch after 9-11. And late tonight, General James Mattis, President Trump's former defense secretary, breaking his silence, denouncing the president as a threat to the Constitution. In a new op-ed, Mattis writes in part, Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite the American people, does not even pretend to try. Instead, he tries to divide us. Mattis writes that the country is witnessing what he calls the consequences of three years of this deliberate effort. Lester? All right, Jeff Bennett tonight. Thank you at the White House. And this evening, from D.C. to cities across the country, there is growing concern about the military-style tactics being adopted by some local law enforcement. With more on that, here's Tom Costello. Across the country, peaceful protests have too often devolved into standoffs with heavily armed police using military-style tactics. Flashbangs, tear gas, rubber bullets, helicopters, armored vehicles. And 30,000 National Guard troops in 31 states and D.C. trying to quell the violence. But a retired Boston police lieutenant and Homeland Security advisor says military equipment and tactics in police work can also backfire. What they are doing in cities across the United States is eroding the trust that they have built up over the decades. The Pentagon's 1033 program gives surplus military equipment to police departments. But that program came under fire during the unrest of Ferguson, Missouri six years ago. President Obama limited the transfers in 2015, but President Trump reinstated the program two years later. Nationwide, 8,000 police departments have received military hardware since 1997. The threat of terrorism after 9-11 convinced many departments to stock up. Now, those departments are facing off against their own citizens. We're out here peacefully protesting, but they're all like they're going to war. For the most part, police in Tucson remain in their regular beat uniforms and work to de-escalate tension. But when officers face bricks, bottles, and gunfire, the chief says departments must switch to tactical gear. There is a time and a place for gear that can protect officers and can allow them to protect the community. I don't think, certainly it's in every situation. I don't think it's necessary with peaceful protesters. In America cities tonight. Like an army, ready to attack. A fine line between protection and provocation. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. Police officers, when they went to that location, or the defendants, when they went to that location, were um, intended to cause the death of Mr. Floyd. But during gone forward yet and I think that it's going to be incumbent upon not just our district attorney but all district attorneys to make sure that that these investigations um, go swiftly because it for the protests 
and the positiveness that I have watched this week's unfolding events, angry and appalled. The words equal justice under law are carved in the pediment of the United States Supreme Court. This is precisely what protesters are rightly demanding. It is a wholesome and unifying demand, one that all of us should be able to get behind. We must not be distracted by a small number of lawbreakers. The protests are defined by tens of thousands of people of conscience who are insisting that we live up to our values, our values as people and our values as a nation. When I joined the military some 50 years ago, I swore an oath to support and defend the Constitution. Never did I dream that troops taking that same oath would be ordered under any circumstance to violate the constitutional rights of their fellow citizens, much less to provide a bizarre photo op for the elected commander in chief with military leadership standing alongside. Military leadership standing alongside. I'm just going to interrupt myself and interrupt the statement for a second here just so I can show you what General Mattis is referencing here. This is something we've talked about this week since it happened. Um, the fact that President Trump really was accompanied by the Defense Secretary, Mark Esper, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, wearing combat fatigues um, when the administration ordered the, the gas and the beatings to attack peaceful protesters in the park across from the White House so the president could walk across that park and pose for pictures on the other side of it. I mean, it says a lot for the president himself to do that, you know, with like his daughter alongside him and the attorney general who apparently ordered the attack on the protesters and, and a bunch of White House staffers with him or whatever. But it actually means something else to us as a republic and it means something else to our military to have the defense secretary representing the defense department and the chairman of the joint chiefs of staff there representing the United States military taking part in that photo op as well. Again, a photo op for which American citizens peacefully demonstrating were gassed and beaten. So the presence of Esper and Milley at that event this week, that is what General Mattis is criticizing there in his statement. All right, uh, back to the statement. He says, quote, we must reject any thinking of our cities as battle space that our uniformed military is called upon to dominate. That is something that, General, uh, that Mark Esper, Secretary of Defense, said on a call with the president and the nation's gun this week, calling the U.S. streets battle space, saying that the military should dominate that battle space. General Mattis continues, quote, at home we should use our military only when requested to do so on very rare occasions by state governors. Militizing, uh, militarizing our response as we witnessed in Washington DC sets up a conflict, a false conflict between the military and civilian society. It erodes the moral ground that ensures a trusted bond between men and women in uniform and the society they are sworn to protect and of which they themselves are a part. Keeping public order rests with civilian state and local leaders who best understand their communities and are answerable to them. James Madison wrote in Federalist 14 that America united with a handful of troops or without a single soldier exhibits a more forbidding posture to foreign ambition than America disunited with a hundred thousand veterans ready for combat. We do not need to militarize our response to protests. We need to unite around a common purpose, and it starts by guaranteeing that all of us are equal before the law. Instructions given by the military departments to our troops before the Normandy invasion reminded soldiers that the Nazi slogan for destroying us was divide and conquer. Our American answer is, in union there is strength. Mattis says, we must summon that unity to surmount this crisis, confident that we are better than our politics. He says, quote, Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite the American people, does not even pretend to try. Instead, he tries to divide us. We are witnessing the consequences of three years of this deliberate effort. We are witnessing the consequences of three years without mature leadership. We can unite without him drawing on the strengths inherent in our civil society. This will not be easy, as the past few days have shown, but we owe it to our fellow citizens, to past generations that bled to defend our promise, and we owe it to our children. We can come through this trying time stronger, and with a renewed sense of purpose and respect for one another. The pandemic has shown us that it is not only our troops who are willing to offer the ultimate sacrifice for the safety of the community, Americans in hospitals, grocery stores, post offices, and elsewhere have put their lives on the line in order to serve their fellow citizens in their country. 
We know that we are better than the abuse of executive authority that we witnessed in Lafayette Park. We must reject and hold accountable those in office who would make a mockery of our Constitution. And it is signed, James Mattis. Marine General James Mattis, uh, Defense Secretary under this president until a year and a half ago, um, with a remarkable statement saying the president has ordered troops to violate Americans' constitutional rights, that the president is using the same strategy against the United States that Nazi Germany used against the United States in World War II. General Mattis saying that the crises we are experiencing now are the result of President Trump's three years of deliberate effort to divide the country. General Mattis saying the president is abusing his executive authority, that he and his administration, including the military leadership and the Defense Department leadership that is supporting what the president is doing right now, Mattis says they are making a mockery of our Constitution and that they all must be rejected and held accountable. I guess this is the time he felt like he needed to speak out. So that happened today. Um, that's one of the things that happened today. You know, in a normal time, in a normal presidency, the president and his party having to abandon the site of his party's nomination con nominating convention for his reelection effort less than three months before that convention was due to start, in a normal presidency, even in a normal troubled presidency, that would be a huge story. They can't have their convention? It's June and they just found out they can't have their convention where they were going to have it in August? I mean, today, in this time of multiple crises, that otherwise huge news barely even made a ripple outside of the city that was going to host the Republican convention that's no longer going to host it. And I should tell you, the way that it is making a ripple in that city's major newspaper can be summed up pretty tidily in the Charlotte Observer's headline on this editorial that they posted this afternoon. Good riddance. They don't even want it anymore. The president had insisted that the Republican convention to formally nominate him as the Republican Party's candidate for president again this year. He has insisted that the convention must be held without any social distancing measures at all, without any face coverings. Uh, what does the mayor of Atlanta say about that? Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms is here with us next. One on. So the police just keep an eye on it. In other places, we've seen that the uh, curfew has now been enforced for uh, three nights in a row. Four nights of curfew, three nights of enforcement. Sean. All right. Uh, great work on the ground. All these reporters putting themselves in harm's way to get you the best report. We're continuing to watch. We'll get back to Brian in just a minute. The situation in Midtown, that was the New York where numbers of people are getting arrested. There is a heavy, heavy rainfall now that has uh, not only hit New York City, but Long Island and other areas hopefully can disperse the crowd at least for one evening. Uh, some though, so far, peaceful protesting, but all it takes is the one brick or the one rock or the one Molotov cocktail and we could be back where we were last number of nights. Jackie Heinrich is on the ground in Philly assessing the damage of the looters and she joins us now. Jackie. Hey there, Sean. Well, federal investigators are looking into what they're calling a coordinated effort to blow up ATMs to steal cash. Since Saturday, police have responded to about 130 incidents around the city, including 50 ATMs just like this one. They say that the looters are sticking dynamite in the slot, lighting it, letting it blow, and you can see the aftermath here. Most of the incidents that happened were at neighborhood convenience stores and gas stations, but there were also incidents where entire... Connecticut and Michigan, they're all coming way back down. They've done the work. They've started to pull out the other side of it. I mean, the, the problem is not New York now. But just for comparison, I mean, there's New York on the left. There's Tennessee on the right. Leave New York up there on the left. Put up North Carolina on the right. Right? I mean, there's, this is two very different scenarios. You, how about we try to move the Republican convention to Arizona? Yeah, let's put Arizona up there on the right. Ooh, that might not be a good idea there either. Uh, maybe we'll go to the deeper south, try it in Arkansas. How about Arkansas? Hmm, mm, maybe not. Uh, look at Mississippi right now. How about we take it to Mississippi? That'd be friendly territory, right? Ooh, South Carolina? Yeah. 
You know, we were counting for all these weeks on the American epidemic shrinking because states hit early, like New York and New Jersey, um, we're, we're getting through it and their numbers are starting to go down. Well, yeah, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Michigan, all these initially hard hit places, uh, we're getting through it and their curves are going down, down, down. But as the rest of the country starts going up, 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 look at the end of that graph there on the right. This is, I mean, American deaths are starting to, this is, it says new reported coronavirus cases by day. This is actually a deaths graph, not a cases graph. But look at the right side of it. American deaths are starting to tick back up again. And that is not because the initially hard hit states are still being quite as hard hit. They're not, their death counts are dropping. This is all of the other surging states in the country outside of the Northeast, taking over the body count themselves now, as is is starting to tick back up in the United States. And you know, what's the limit here? What is the ceiling we think we are heading for with new case curves that look like this in all these states now? Wishing and hoping and choosing to believe that the coronavirus epidemic is going away isn't the same thing as it going away. I mean, this week, as the president decided he, he needed to move the Republican convention this summer out of North Carolina, because North Carolina's governor insisted on remembering that we are in the middle of a viral epidemic and their curve looks like this. I mean, this week we got big new outbreaks in, in weird new places. A fishing fleet in Washington state turned around its big factory trawler fishing boats after most of the crew of 126 sailors on board one of their trawlers tested positive. Another 200, 200 plus cases out of a paper products manufacturing plant in Kansas City, paper products manufacturing. Also, outbreak among the construction crew working on the new football stadium at the University of Alabama. How about a Tennessee farm where the owner says 100% of the more than 200 farm workers on the, for, more than 200 farm workers on site are positive there. And of course, the places where the epidemic is the worst aren't getting any better. Another 591 workers test positive at a Tyson meat plant, this time in Storm Lake, Iowa. That huge outbreak at that Tyson meat plant in, in Storm Lake, Iowa has made that county, Buena Vista County in Iowa, one of the most infected places on earth right now per capita. Also a, a federal prison in Butner, North Carolina, where they are only just now getting around to testing everyone. After six prisoners died there in eight days, they're finally realizing, hmm, maybe we ought to test everybody at Butner. Six people dead in eight days. The way our federal government is dealing with the pandemic now is just not to deal with it. Just to decide that it's not happening, it's over, it's an old story. We'd rather talk about other things now. But they're also dismantling their effort to, that, that they used to ineffectually deal with it thus far. I mean, the coronavirus task force isn't really meeting anymore. The top infectious disease expert in the U.S. government, Tony Fauci, says he's not meeting with the White House or with the president anymore. The man in charge of coronavirus testing for the administration, the testing czar, is resigning from that job now. And the plan is to not replace him with anyone. Because why bother? They're just not going to work on that at the federal level anymore. Which seems especially astonishing given how we as a country have been spending the early part of our summer this year. The Associated Press reporting today that in the national uproar against racism and police use of deadly force in the wake of George Floyd's death in Minneapolis, significant demonstrations have taken place in every single one of the 25 U.S. communities that have the highest concentrations of new cases of coronavirus. So in the places in America where the coronavirus epidemic is growing the fastest, where they've got the highest concentrations of new cases, we've had demonstrations in every single one of those 25 places. And we will see whatever the impact of that may be on the pandemic in the next couple of weeks. As the case numbers start to turn up, as people start to get tested, as people start to get sick, as, people's turn, as people turn up at the hospital. But we're not there yet. We are making a lot of progress. He can reminisce all he want. His police officers, as Mayor Giuliani's been telling him and warning him for days on end, are under attack. And thanks to New York's absolute insane bail reform and Governor Cuomo's bill, and he signs it, most crimes now require, as soon as you get arrested, no bail whatsoever.
So police, then they are forced to now deal with the same criminals night after night after night. In January, there was a guy that robbed four different banks, released from jail under this policy, just to go out and rob another one. Get arrested again, go rob another one. That's how insane that is. And now we're likely seeing with the, the same thing with the looters, the rioters, and the arsons. However, New York's attorney, who was arrested for throwing that Molotov cocktail into a police car, well, he was forced to post bail. A miracle. Lucky for her, a former Obama intel official actually helped post the bail for her. Wow. And meanwhile, according to a brand new FoxNews.com report, the Black Lives Matter Foundation is apparently preparing for a, quote, war on police. Now, they're reporting training a bunch of armed individuals to protect their community from law enforcement. They're calling themselves peace officers. Now, keep in mind, okay, Black Lives Matter, they have a mission, eradicate white supremacy. No American, no good American is bigoted or racist, okay? You have to protect every American and every American's rights. I agree with that, too. All good Americans stand against racism and bigotry, but apparently now they're willing to do it with what? An armed militia? How do we interpret that? In other words, they want to push the police out of neighborhoods? They're the neighborhood's first line of defense. You're going to replace them with your armed militia? Let's just say, I don't have any confidence in that idea. Now, joining us with reaction, the president of the New York Police Sergeants Benevolent Association, Ed Mullins, and Fox News contributor, Dan Bongino, and Fox News correspondent. Quickly. So the question becomes, what does that all mean? Uh, by the way, right now we're looking in Brooklyn uh, or in Manhattan right now, but I was showing you the video in question in Atlanta. Is the speed with which the charges came a reflection of it being done the right way, uh, or is, and that usually we wait too long because they're police officers and the system doesn't treat them the way it treats its citizens, or is it a reflection of us playing politics in a moment of crisis and a prosecutor trying to gain political advantage as an elected servant uh, to do something that may be popular at the expense of the police? You know, as it relates to this, I can't speak to the motives of the district attorney, um, but what I, I can say is that even the, the quickness in which the two officers was fired, were fired um, is a, a shift for us, but it was also a shift because I normally wouldn't sit in the room for four hours and review body cam video footage either, but I think it speaks to where we are in America, but specifically in terms of the swiftness, I think the district attorney will have to speak to that. Mm.